Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. John Ravicki, welcome back to the What Is Money show. It's a great pleasure to be back here again, Robert. And uh, as I was saying before we turned on the camera, your proposal of this series was irresistible to me. So I just had to come back. <laughs> well, all credit is due to you because you recommended this book that we're gonna be examining uh, and I think, I don't recall, I think I sent you a DM that is asking for reading recommendations. And this was, you sent me two that were at the top of your list. And this was one of them. Mm. Title of the book is Plato's critique of impure reason. The author is DC Schindler book looks like, Oh, well, that's not going to work. My screen's blurred. We'll get a, a link to it in the show notes. Um, and just by way of quick reintroduction. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Go to your copy. Um, yeah. You've been on the show before, but just by way of quick reintroduction, you are the Associate Professor of Cognitive Science and Psychology at the University of Toronto, and you are the creator of the quite popular YouTube series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I think there's going to be quite a bit of, well, at least a lot of your work on Awakening from the Meaning Crisis um, some of it is rooted in this book as well, I believe. Yes, uh, yes. I, I mean, I read this book after I was done the series, mm. but the way I've been extending what I did in the series into more recent work has been deeply influenced by this book. Robert, I'd also like to say something from the very beginning, um, something I tweeted about. Uh, I, I read this book on a weekly basis with my good friend and colleague and co-author Dan Chiappi, and I can't cleanly separate what I came up with what Dan came up with. <laughs> so I want to share credit uh, right from the beginning with Dan Chappie, but that doesn't mean that any of the mistakes I made should be attributed to him. Um, so, um, but I just want that very, very clearly understood right from the, right from the get go. Well, as usual, you are gracious, humble, and always doing a great job of attributing all the thinkers that have influenced you and inspire you. Um, but I think that this, there's some really big ideas in this book. So, yes. Um, yeah, I'm just reminded of the Carl Jung quote that, you know, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. So <laughs> this one's yeah. definitely captured me. Um, okay, is, would you, before we jump in, I think it would be great if you could just give kind of a general synopsis of what this book is about and the direction you think this conversation is going to go. I know you can't get it all in a, a summary, but um, you're such an eloquent speaker. I would love to just hear you tell the audience where we're headed over the next 15 hours. <laughs> well, I think the central argument of this book is one that is convergent with and has helped to amplify an argument I've been trying to make, which is uh, a recovery, a reinventio, which means both discovery and invention of a, a richer understanding of rationality that brings back its spiritual, sapiential, having to do with wisdom, 
its spiritual and sapiential dimensions in a way that are sorely needed today, especially in responding to the meaning crisis. So DC Schindler is proposing that Plato's Republic, which is what the book is, a, is an extended reflection on, uh, DC Schindler's book, is an account of that notion of reason that we need to recover. And I think this is so convergent with work I've been doing independently on trying to get a deeper, broader, richer understanding of reason and connect it both to the spiritual and to the sapiential that I find this book a masterpiece uh, for exactly that project. And uh, Schindler wants to point out that one of, and this is a, this goes perfectly to your point about it, how it's helped explicate aspects of the meaning crisis, which Dan and I talked about at length is, right, this impoverishment of reason and, and, and its trivialization and neglect and ultimately uh, often rejection um, ha has been a, cons a, a significant contributor to the meaning crisis. It's certainly an exacerbator of it. Yeah, very well said. Um, and with that said, I guess we'll just jump into the introduction of the book and we'll start working our way sequentially through the chapters. Sure. Um, and I'll occasionally read a few excerpts here and then I'll have questions. But I think, as you just said, really the big, the big theme is, you know, uncovering the importance of reason or re re discovering the importance of reason or rationality that we seem to have diverged from uh, in, in the modern age. And so one of the things, you know, the introduction of the book opens with is the question, what reason could one possibly give for reason? It goes on yeah. to say the very raising of the question seems at once to deny the possibility of answering and to force a particular answer. It's almost kind of like a meta question in a way. Yes, yes. And um, another excerpt from the book, reason, Nietzsche will say, is at root irrational. Truth is a subspecies of falsehood that has been elevated above other falsehoods for quote unquote reasons that cannot be measured against the standard of reason itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation earlier today with uh, Matthias Desmet, who's done some work on mass psychosis, and he was making one of the points he makes in his book is that all the great thinkers, all the great scientists, really, they end up going beyond rationality or realizing the limits of rationality in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And so it seems like we're sort of exploring something similar here as like trying to look trying to see the bounds of rationality or reason and, and if it connects to something that's transcendent, I think, which may, perhaps is the platonic notion of the good, which we'll get into. Um, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but maybe we could start here because one of the, I think the translation for the word region, reason is ratio right? Yep. Which is the yep. same spelling as the word we know as ratio. This is root word of rationality, um, perhaps also related to the logos. I'm not sure, but I'll let you yes. explain that. And the other side of the ratio coin, or, the, or there's another term, I don't know if it's the other side of the coin, is religio. hope I'm saying that right. correctly. Yes, yes. And I guess we would sort of summarize this dichotomy as ratio being science, rationality and religio being religion yes yes to some extent yeah. how are both ratio and religio indispensable to civilization or, or to being um or whichever direction you want to take this question um sure I, well i'd like to pick up the question because i think one of the central things that schindler is trying to do in the book um, is to challenge that dichotomy and to show the deep interpenetration between ratio, proper proportioning, and religio, proper connectedness. Mm -hmm. And that uh, what we're doing in reason is we are trying to properly proportion our attention 
and our thinking and our discussion so that we enter into religio, right relationship with the whole. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that is the best way that, uh, that binding of ourselves to something beyond ourselves um, as the whole and our proper proportioning of our faculties towards that connectivity is what will give us the best chance of coming into contact, conformity with reality. And then um, Schindler wants to say that that contemplative aspect of reason needs no in independent justification or modification. It is intrinsically good to bring about that kind of fundamental understanding. Um, so, you know, th that was very sort of abstract language, but if you think about it, right, right, think about how the two are together in something that he talks about. And again, I want to bring this up because this is another theme, and, and it's actually the, the, the part of the title of his next book, but at least the next book I read by him. Um, think about when you love somebody, you are always trying to properly proportion how you're attending to them how you're talking with them, uh, I, because you're trying to get this ratio, because what you're trying to do is get the best possible connectedness to them. And when you love them, that proper proportioning is in the service of, you know, like if you just love your partner because she has a great mouth or, or, or you love your partner uh, just because she's a particularly good sexual lover, right? Many people would, would I think, rightly say, well, that's not, lo that's not love. That's a, you know, but when, when you really love a person, you are like, you are pursuing something that you will never get a grasp on, which is the whole, you love the whole person. And, and, and that's a distinguishing feature between sort of love and just possessiveness. And so you can see here how the two are intermingling. I want to connect to this person, but if I'm going to connect to them really, I'm connecting to the whole of them, but that means I have to properly proportion. I have to set in ratio, in ratio, how I am paying attention to them, how I'm reflecting upon them, how I'm listening to them and speaking to them. Just, just think of it there. Think about how much religio with another person depends on getting the right ratio of speaking and listening with them. Yes, yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. I've um, The ratio being the proper proportioning of attention I think, or I, maybe multiple things. And then- Yeah, the proper, yeah, yes, exactly. The proper proportioning of attention, discourse, reflection, speaking, listening, all the ways in which we are proper proportioning so that we establish the religio in a reciprocal opening that's constantly leading us into the whole of the reality of the person. Okay, yeah, and the, the religio being proper connectedness Yes. Which I think is another way to say love, which you also yes. just brought up reciprocal opening. I know we talked about that last time, that being kind of a, a dynamic associated with love as well. Um, I, you know, the, the other underlying theme here for me is just fitness itself. You know, yes. we're, you're trying to establish fitness to the whole of yeah. someone or something, but there's sort of these two different aspects you have to balance i guess ratio and, and religio um, uh, so i guess there's a ratio of even <laughs> ratio to religio right you're trying to find the right ratio between the two yes exactly and ex and you see how you see how ratio is already doing it you are trying to move towards the whole even in understanding the relationship between ratio and religio but yes there was a ratio uh, of the rat of the relationship between ratio and religio but it also made you more connected to that relationship it, it, and this is this is this is and the fact that that we so readily see these as separable when it's so easy to show in our ongoing cognition and, and our attempt to make sense how deeply interwoven they are this gives a lot of initial plausibility to Schindler's proposal. If it's so obvious in our experience and when we look on the phenomenology of our, of our cognition and our connection and so forth, we find this deep interpenetration and yet culturally they seem so distinct from each other, that lends plausibility to 
to uh, Schindler saying, look, we, there's grounds for an important critique of the modern understanding of reason. Makes a lot of sense. So um, just by way of connection then, ratio or ratio we're associating with human reason mm -hmm. and then relig relig religio we are associating yeah. with love well i'm relig i was actually trying to show how in love both of them are coming together mm, that's what okay. i was, I was right. trying to do. okay uh, and if you say what does reason have to do with love well if, if reason does not contain within it a love for the truth or the real it's hard to understand what distinguishes reason from many other endeavors that human beings engage in. So that's why I went, one of Schindler's points, uh, and I was trying to sort of feed two birds with one stone, right? One of Schindler's points is, you know, the, the deeper sense of reason is a love for what's real, a love for, in that sense, a love for ontological truth. And so I was using love, romantic love, as a metaphor, an instance for how ratio and religio come together. That's what I was trying to do. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. So Schindler goes on in the introduction here to talk about the modern misconceptions of reason. Mm. And, um, you know, a lot of this, I think he's pointing at postmodernism in general, that there is a, a misunderstanding of the concept of reason, or, or perhaps a, uh, he's relativizing, not he, Postmodernists are relativizing the concept of reason itself, perhaps. Um, yeah. now I'll just read a quick excerpt here. Schindler writes, what prompts the writing of this book is the belief that the explicit dismantling of reason and its claim that occurs in certain circles within the academy is merely the reflection of a more profound, more subtle, and more pervasive problem the general acceptance of a radically impoverished conception of reason, both by those who deny and many of those who affirm reason's claims. So what, where did we go astray here? It seems like reason is very fundamental to civilization, obviously, and you know, there's kind of the seems like there's two poles you could be reasonable with someone to resolve a conflict or you could be unreasonable or even violent or something like more animalistic perhaps to resolve yes. that conflict yes. yes so if human reason is this this ratio faculty um what, what and i know you distinguish between indispensable and necessary so where does human reason fit into this larger picture of civilization? Um, okay, excellent question. First of all, uh, notice what the last thing he said, by those who deny and many of those who affirm reasons claim. So Schindler's critique is actually directed against both uh, the modernists and the postmodernists. And uh, um, so I think there's two moves in, in, in sort of the declension of the diminishment uh, of reason. And then one, the first central move, and I go over this in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, was uh, the, the reduction of reason to computation, um, typified by Descartes and Hobbes. Um, and notice they can be very different in terms of their fundamental ontology, but they, sh they, they shared this. And this is a result of a lot of thinkers before, like Occam and Duns Scotus, and I won't go over the whole history, but what, I, when I, what this is, is this idea that what reason is fundamentally is um, the logical manipulation of propositions in order to generate true conclusions. That's what I mean by computation. I, I mean it in the, the way that uh, uh, Descartes and Hobbes meant it. And so you get the, you get the idea that um, reasoning is basically like running a, you know, a, a computer program. It's a, a logical coding, a syntactic relation. And you get the idea that what reason does is it, it, it's basically an implementation of a formal system, logic or math or probability theory. And that becomes a hallmark. Now that move, right, of equating reason with computation is in stark contrast to what we were just talking about, reason as contemplation. So we go from reason as contemplation, which is this way of trying to enter into a relationship 
with what is more real and reciprocally open towards it by properly proportioning yourself so that you are transformed more by as you try more and more to conform to these deeper patterns of reality. So you're, you're going from a contemplative notion of reason and rationality to a computational reason. Now notice something you said a minute ago because it still harkens to the older view. When you talk about somebody being reasonable, sometimes what we, we, we mean is, well, they should be logical, right? They should, be, but often we don't mean that. We mean you weren't paying, you weren't properly proportioning your attention. Like when we say somebody, like in the court of law, when we say the reasonable person, we don't mean somebody who can run logical argumentation. We mean somebody who pays attention to the right things in the right way, considers things in the right way, reflects on, th how, reflects on how the big picture and the small picture relate together. So even in our, we have, a, we have a vestige, an echo of the contemplative sense of reason when we, when we sometimes invoke this notion of reasonableness, like you did when you were talking about how we require reasonableness for a civilization. Now, David Hume comes to the, he's quickly after Descartes and Hobbes, and he comes to the conclusion that there's no difference, you know, there's no, there's no and Schindler talks about this, between somebody preferring to not have their fingers scratched than having all humans on the, on the earth killed. And, and you go, what? And what humans means by that is they can equally give legitimate arguments and you can't infer from is to ought. And so there's no way of computing a difference between those positions. Now, no, and th that example is pertinent because it calls out the difference between com computational, right? rationality and contemplative because we would say what no no this person isn't giving the right attention or the right concern or the right consent they're not properly proportioning their consciousness and their cognition right to do uh you know to do to be in proper relationship religio uh with the reality of things and so that first move was the move from contemplative to computational rationality and then the second move, which comes out of postmodernism, was the recognition, both within continental philosophy, structuralism, and analytic philosophy, Anglo-Americanism, that these formal systems couldn't justify, couldn't ground themselves, could, couldn't ultimately explain themselves, always had gaps, always had things that fell outside the formal system that was needed in order to run uh, the formal system. Um, I'll give you one quick example. This is from Jerry Fodor, who was a strong proponent of, listen to my words, please, the computational theory of mind, the theory that cognition is computation. But he said, you know, there's a really big difficulty in that, right? Now, he, he comes to a, a, an opposite conclusion than I do, but I just want to lay it out. He said, you know, if cognition is computation, then your competence is the logic you're using. And he says, we think that children go through development. They actually get better in their competence. It's not just that they acquire more knowledge. They get better at knowing and learning. That's Piaget. This is all a developmental psychology. But then he does this move. He says, but if cognition is computation, improving your competence would be to move from a weaker logic to a stronger logic. OK? There is no logical, namely inferential way to go from a weaker logic to a stronger logic. If I'm in predicate logic, I can manipulate it till the end of time in all the possible form, you know, formal relations, and I will never generate modal logic because I have to step outside the logic and introduce new axioms. And so right. he says, right. right? And he says, therefore, there's, there can be, and so, and notice what he does here. He says, if cognition is computation, there can't be a computational account of development. And now you're forced on a decision. He, and he, he bites the bullet. He says, so there really isn't anything like development, which just flies in the face of all kinds of empirical evidence. Or you conclude, as I would, oh, no, no, there's development. And that means cognition can't be just computation. I'm, I'm, I don't mean that to be a lockdown argument. I meant it to be an example. There are many, many arguments like this. And I'm trying to give one within sort of Anglo-American philosophy because continental, you know, postmodernism tends to be obscure to people. 
I'm trying to show you that there was a recognition that that identification of reason with computation, right, fell apart. It was internally inconsistent. It couldn't explain itself. It would lead to sort of absurd conclusions. It was always pointing, right, or relying on something that couldn't be captured in the computation. My own work is about relevance, with, which Fodor also argued can't be captured by computation. So I'm, I'm trying to do that as fast as I can, but you've got these two moves. Contemplative becomes computational, even calculative. And then that is shown to be, it, like, that it, it can't, it can't, it can't achieve the goals it sets for itself. It, it can't fully ground itself, justify itself, produce itself inferentially, develop itself inferentially, et cetera, et cetera. And so postmodernism now says, right? Postmodernism shares with modernism this truncated definition of rationality and then undermines it, often with legitimate criticisms. But the problem is what, what Schindler is saying is, and that's what that quote points to, you have to step out of both of those, postmodernism and modernism, see the truncated and, you know, sometimes in some sense trivialized notion of reason, rationality, that they are sharing one positively, one negative. And Schindler wants to say, no, that, that presupposition has to be rejected. We need to return back to the contemplative account of reason. Sorry, that was a long speech, but, I, but it's like, that's how, again, I could say so much more, but that's, that's how we got here. Uh, and, the, and the fact that we use rational and logical as if they are synonymous and interchangeable, epitomized by, you know, Mr. Spock, um, that, that shows you how far we have come. And notice how Star Trek does that, by the way, because it's on the cusp between modernism and postmodernism. Rationality has been reduced to logicality, computationalism, Mr. Spock, right? And there's still some dignity there, but, but Kirk represents the intuition outside the formal system that's actually needed to be the captain, right? And that's all, and we like that and it's sort of romantic, but it's, that's very problematic putting those two together. Yeah, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, is it all, I mean, this is almost a, yin and yang type of thing where you've got the internal consistency of the system but that system always has to be axiomatically rooted in something beyond itself right you, it's almost like the as the book goes into the beginning the beginning of the book we'll get into this later but where to begin right you never know which axioms or where to begin to frame the whole thing um and just being familiar with some of your work, a couple of things I was reminded of here is you mentioned the the con contemplative side of this, of side of reason. That's what we've jettisoned, right? We've sort of shut that one yes. out and said, oh, reason is just logic now. We've mistakenly connected those two. But And with that goes the, and I think he gets into this later, the ecstatic yes. nature of reason, right? There's something... Yes beyond yes. it's touching something yes. transcendent the good whatever it may be yes and is this connected to because i watched a little bit of your series uh the elusive eye yes where you talk yes. about actual self-identification and that you can keep taking those steps backward but you can never reach the eye right there's always another step outside of oneself to be taken so you can never yes. land on this is that and I might just be mixing a bunch of things here, so please parse as you will. No, 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 no. Is no, that, this is good. Uh, I guess, the, the, the elusive eye, human reason, and I've also heard you use this term autopoetic, where yes. it's like uh, life, I don't know, I'm not sure about autopoetic, we're sort of like perhaps bootstrapping ourselves into existence or, or realizing uh, the relevance of, of reality itself through these these processes. I mean, there seems to be, I don't know, what's an easy way to say this. We keep trying to isolate individual variables and say, oh, that's the thing. But it yeah. seems like we always find out, no, it's always about the relation between those two things. And yes. so you can never fully pin down the relation because the relation is itself inherently dynamic. And there's one so, last thing I'll say on this is 
just through the lens of economics, Mises would say the market process is irreducible. So when I hear stuff like that, I think, oh, it's a market process. You can't reduce it any further. So, wow, that was a lot. Uh, so first of all, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. The stepping back and looking at, and the fact that you can never get, I mean, so the, the, that I, me relationship is an instance of a broader thing where uh, whereas I can never get inside the frame, the process of framing. So the decision, and, and I think this lines up to, in some significant ways, uh, I, I wouldn't claim it's identical, but I think there's convergence with, you know, uh, some of Derrida's notions about difference. But the idea is the decisions I make, uh, uh, in, uh, right, um, in order uh, as to what to include inside the frame aren't in the frame. The processes, right, a relevance realization that are framing and excluding so much information and making me ignore it are not in the frame precisely because the function of the frame is to exclude them. So, right, it, right. So the framing, pro and well, what I'll do is I'll step back and look at those framing processes, but then all you've done is done this, like you just said. And so you're constantly realizing, wait, I can't actually bring the process, the, the complete process of framing within any particular frame. Um, right. So, right. That, that, and so that points to something really, again, there's, there's, there's always something that eludes the grasp of, uh, of the formal system. Now, the, the, thing, the thing you were then, another point you were talking to that we have to get really clear on is this ecstatic, I have ecstasis tattooed on my, on my leg. Um, <laughs> this, right, this realization that I always have to be transframing has with it two moments. I'm always realizing I need to move to a more encompassing whole and always remembering that I can never get the whole. But if I, right, but I can only be true, the only way I can be true to, and see how this goes beyond the truth of propositions, the only way I can be true to reality is to engage in a, an ecstatic process of continually trying to self transcend. So although I am oriented towards wholeness, I never make any totalitarian claims about having the totality. This is Levinas's distinction between totality and infinity. Drew Hyland come, has this really clearly in his book on Plato, where he talks about finite transcendence. Plato was trying to bring together these two things as a fundamental understanding of human being and human rationality. We are we never cease being finite, but we never cease being called to transcendence. And we can err on either side. We can be, think we can just become God, inflationary, or we can think we are bound and, 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 and we're just locked in and it's just dog eat dog or, you know, a Machiavellian struggle for power and there is no transcendent, right? And, and what Plato was trying to say is, right, no. It, it, we are. We have to keep both of those poles if we are going to stay true to reality, and that again is a, reati a ratio that puts us into religio. The right kind of religio is the religio that makes us humble lovers of the whole. Beautifully said, and I don't want to jump ahead, but one of the things that really struck me in this book towards the end is that. Plato encoded that ratio into the very structure of the Republic, right? It wasn't just yes. the propositional words. It's actually how he laid oh. out the books and yeah. it's communicated yeah. on more than one level. So that's what makes totally. the book. So uh, I guess able of communicating this deeper truth and something that's even more than words. Right. And I, I thought one way I've thought about this too is like, what, you know, when you read a book, where's the meaning in the book, you could say it's in the words or it's in the letters or it's in the sentences or the paragraphs or the chapters, but not it's in, it's between, right. It's the relational yeah, yes. We're back to the relational yes. aspect. And it seems like Plato just took that to its extreme yes. where he encoded this, the structure of reality, I guess, for lack of a better term into the very structure of the Republic, the books of the Republic. Um, so yeah, again, sorry, don't mean to ruin the ending. I was just blown away by that. No, um, I, but I think that's I think that's I think that's pertinent right now. I, I hope we return back to it uh, because th this explains why 
Plato wrote in dramatic dialogue. Because I mean, to use some of my language, Plato is basically saying that 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 commitment to be to be transformatively true to the real, to the whole, takes the whole of you. It takes all of the kinds of knowing, the propositional, the procedural, the perspectival, and the participatory. And virtue, uh, a virtue, is, is is some combination of belief, skill, state of mind, and trait of character. And so. Plato is saying you have to virtually use all of you in order to have the best possibility of right relationship to the whole that is realness, reality. And notice, we know that we know there's something fundamentally right about that. Why are scientists, physicists, why have they been bashing their heads against integrating right, relativity and quantum mechanics? Because when they're disintegrated, we don't have an account. We, we aren't oriented to the whole. We're oriented in a fragmented way. And, and we don't have the correct, I, I wanna do this right now. We don't have the correct theory, but what does the word theory come from? It comes from the Greek word theoria, which means to contemplate, to look in the right way, to see something in a transformative fashion, to look into the depths. It actually originally meant to travel to see something. So there's this notion of movement, to travel to see something that will transform you in the depths. Now we've taken theory in the Platonic sense, theoria, and again, we've tended to reduce it, but, but the echo of the Platonic desire to relate to the whole, to pursue the whole is still within, uh, is still a driving force, even in the heart of physics. Yeah, that's a great point there. The, and you could almost perhaps say, you know, that is the great unsolved problem in physics today is reconciling, as you said, relativity with quantum mechanics yes. or quantum physics. And in a way, obviously, relativity reflects ratio, right? It's everything's relative to everything else. Quantum mechanics is this weird transcendent domain where logic and math breaks down, causality breaks down. So it's almost like trying to reconcile uh, the ecstatic nature, perhaps, of quantum mechanics with the rational nature of relativity. Um, well, at least the relational la 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 nature of relativity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting that that dynamic sort of shows up in these different domains. Um, and physics, I've always been, yeah, physics was one that spoke very loudly <laughs> to me most of my life. So it's interesting to see that these two worlds connect. Um, Okay, I want to talk real quick because he introduces the concept of skepticism mm -hmm. and differentiates it from mythology. And so I'll read just a couple of excerpts and then ask you some questions. He writes, the difficulty is that in order to understand something as an appearance rather than as the reality itself, one must be able to contrast it with what is other than appearance. In other words, in order to, quote unquote, see through all appearances, conventions, prejudices, and presuppositions, which is the skeptic's pride, one must in fact see beyond them. A fish could never, quote unquote, know it was in water without at some point breaking the surface. And he uses the term, he says, using the term in a way slightly different from Plato's usage, let us give the name mythology to this utterly radicalized skepticism, followed all the way down to its practical conclusions. For Plato, mythology is what befalls one who has been burned by reason and now harbors a deep mistrust and resentment. He refers to mythology as the greatest evil a person can suffer. If skepticism preserves the differences between knowledge and ignorance and affirms the latter, the ruined form of reason represented by mythology surrenders even this. It gives up not only any basis for distinguishing what is rational from what is not, but also any felt need to make the distinction. This point cannot be overstated if we wish to understand our present situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Plato makes the point that mythology is one of the greatest evils a person can suffer. It seems to me like those afflicted by mythology are also capable of the greatest evils. People that just totally throw yeah. reason out and need, any need to pursue reason. It's all power. You know, uh, what is the, you know, um, 
what do they call it? The art politic or um, real politic, I think is yeah. kind of like related, perhaps related to mythology. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then I'm, I'm curious, are these modern attacks on reason? Is this so, some, some kind of enacted mythology, perhaps? I think that's Schindler's, uh, Schindler's point. Um, so uh, the three, your, your choice of quotes, by the way, is very good. Um, Thank you. Um, so uh, I mean, the, the, notice the first thing about the fish in the water. Uh, if, the, if the fish can't ever break the surface, uh, the fish can't be aware of the difference between right, appearance and reality. Uh, and notice that's the ecstatic moment of reason. And this, and Spinoza brought this out, truth is only known in transformation, in transcendence. It's only when I transcend something that I can distinguish between right, what was real about it and what was uh, misleading appearance about it. Um, when you're trapped in the nine dot problem, you don't know that you're trapped in the nine dot problem other than you're not achieving your goal. Um, it's when you break out of the frame that you realize, oh, the frame was wrong, right? So there's, there's right. that ecstatic moment of transframing is central. Now, the thing that he makes in the, the, the quote is, if you abandon the contemplative, you get reduced to right, the computational. And then the computational person says, well, you know, here's the logic, here's appearance and reality, and, and right, and, and that maps onto knowledge and ignorance. But our, our our logic actually can't get us through to reality, and therefore we're kind of screwed. Now, I have to be careful here. And Schindler is he makes the distinction between ancient skepticism and modern skepticism. We're talking about modern skepticism, sort of Hume, Hume as the prototypical example of this. So Hume values, he values argumentation and he uses it to show that argumentation can't get us knowledge. And then he concludes, well, therefore there's no knowledge. The misologist, misologist gives up that respect for argumentation. So he, they give up even the truncated model of rationality and says, you, you know, forget trying to argue right, in the philosophical sense of an argument, right? No, it's, I don't care about, I just, I want this, and this is what, right? Because in some way, and I don't know if, if Schindler is alluding to this or not, they might have been attracted to the modern computational model of rationality, and, that got, and then got burned by its critiques and insufficiency. And now they're resentful of ever, it, it, it almost feels like a jilted lover kind of response. They're mm -hmm. resentful, that they were once they once bought into that computational model, and that's the misologist. Now Schindler's point is both the skeptic and the misologist are on a trajectory that he wants us to get off of by returning back to the contemplative notion of rationality. Yeah, great points there. Um, hmm, it's interesting uh, the. The whole contemplative notion not fitting inside of the computational notion. Um, yeah, it just seems like the window to transcendence to, in some way, because a lot of, I guess, rationality itself, we could kind of say we're running, it is computational, right? right? Rationality, perhaps. But again, I might be messing up the words here, but uh, when you include the rationality plus the contemplative aspect would get you to human reason, right? Whereas yes. rationality would be just be the computational component of that. Uh, it, that seems to me to imply design to some extent, intelligent design, perhaps. It's like, where did that, where did the contemplative come from? Um, ah, ah, so that, I think that's, I mean, it depends what kind of design. Um, first, uh, the, I, I would, I'm proposing that we reserve the word logic for the uh, computational exercise, and I think logic is an important thing, um, and that we use the word reason and rationality for the contemplative attempt to oh, okay. get a ratio religio to what is most real. Um, and and you're right that 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 the fact that the contemplative doesn't fit inside the computational or another variation on it, the communicative. Uh, Rationality is just how we try to influence each other, 
which is another notch down. We can talk about that in a, a few minutes. Um, but you're right. The fact that the, the, the contemplative doesn't fit into the computational does open you right, to transcendence, which is, again, to point out that for Plato, rationality and spirituality are inherently bound together. But they're bound together because they're also bound to wisdom, sapience. Because the capacity for wisdom, right, self-transcendence and the capacity to realize one has been self-deluded are two ways of talking about the same thing. We, we tend to forget this. We tend to think of self-transcendence as just sort of a wonderful woo, right, kind of thing. That's not what is meant, ecstasis, to stand beyond yourself. But it's you stand beyond yourself so you can look back, reflect, right? So that's why I was using the example of breaking out of the nine-dot problem. That's a, that you transcend the formulation, and that, that self-transcendence is simultaneously a mode, a, a note, uh, an act of self-criticism and self-correction, and they're all bound up together in the insight. Right? And so that helps to explain how our capacity for contemplation right, and contemplative rationality might have arisen. It might have arisen out of the inadequacies of communication and computation that we need something that allows us to engage in very sophisticated kinds of self-correction and reproportion our attention and what we consider relevant and important, et cetera. And you can see why, again, notice how that's the case, right? When you're trying to do good communicative, right? Rationality, when you're just trying to persuade somebody, if you, if, if you are virtuous and not, trying to manipulate them or deceive them, then part of what you have to do is transcend your own perspective if you want genuine communication with them. And, and note from the other person's perspective the defects of your own perspective and go further, internalize that. And so you get the ability, metacognitive ability, to reflect on your own. And that's where your capacity of self-transcendence. Or you're doing all these computations and you realize that this particular formal system is somehow inadequate, you need to step out of it, right? And you get what is even today called dialectical reasoning, which is the ability to not work within a formal system, but move between formal systems. So both the, the need to engage in deep kinds of self-correction within communication and within computation, they both drive and therefore mutually empower a need for this kind of radical self-transcendence. So there's a, there's a connection between this ongoing need for self-transcendence and error correction. Um, yes. Yeah. And well, I, I, one kind of error, there's error within a formal system, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and the formal system is good at pointing that out, but there's also the error of a formal system. Right. There's, there's error within uh, communication. You didn't hear me. That's not what I'm saying, right? Right. And literally, you didn't hear me. And then there's error of your perspective on right. the conversation, right? A, mi a misframing or a faulty yeah. axiom, perhaps. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, I just, uh, you, you mentioned this earlier, the theoria, and I just wanted to share one way that I've thought about that, that I think is useful is, you know, for as long as we've been on this planet, we've seen the sun rising and the sun setting. And for a really long time, the theory, the theory was that we were the center of the universe and, you know, the sun's going around us and around us and around us. But in that one, this would be a pers perspectival shift, I guess, thanks to Copernicus, we realized, yeah. oh, wait, the sun's in the middle. We're not. We're the one rotating. And in that one instant of theoria or theoretic realization, all the past empirical data gets reinterpreted, right? We're like, yes. oh, we were yes. seeing it's we're seeing the same thing. The data didn't change at all, but just our perspective shifts and it it completely inverts the whole perspective. Excellent. Excellent. And let's remember 
that there were many people, in fact, Copernicus is relying on Tycho Brahe and others and all of the Arab astronomers who were doing intricate mathematical computations within the Ptolemaic system. They were completely, they were experts at the logical manipulation of the Ptolemaic system. And, and, and Copernicus did this move, which is really important. Like if you move this around, he said the math is better. He didn't mean, right, the, the, he was calculating better. He meant that right, he, he was bringing almost an aesthetic appreciation to bear, right? He moved to a different, right? He introduced something else because he was returning back to, right, you know, this, I want to be, right, why do you want the math to be more beautiful? Because there was some platonic sense that that was giving us a greater potential to be connected to reality. Yeah, the, the elegance of a mathematical formula, right? There's, um, he was perhaps drawn to that for reasons that are not mathematical, right? Some aesthetic exactly. appreciation, yeah. Well, I, I'm, being, I'm, I'm being more definitive. He was drawn to that exactly by platonic aesthetics drawn from a contemplative uh, tradition. It's, yeah, beautiful, literally. Um, okay, I, I guess we should talk quickly about dogmatism. I don't know. I'll just read an excerpt here. Let me just see which one. So um, I'll read both, I guess. He writes, the problem with dogmatism is that it is, it is essentially relativistic. By making a particular claim definitive in isolation from the integral whole, within which that claim would have its reasonable sense-giving ground, dogmatism yeah. ends up absolutizing the relative and therefore making the relative a ni plus ultra, which I think that means the ultimate. The problem with relativism is that it is essentially dogmatic. By equalizing all perspectives in a wholly undifferentiated manner, relativism makes each perspective in itself a kind of self-contained totality, which is therefore on its own term, incontrovertible and thus definitive. Yes. And there's a, there's a footnote here that I think is worth reading too. Uh, he says, it ought to be noted in this context that the insistence on dogma is not necessarily dogmatism. In fact, some form of quote unquote, suprapersonal absolute within which an individual inserts himself is arguably necessary ultimately to avoid dogmatism. Yes. As used here, the term dogmatism means the absolutizing of an individual perspective. So the, I mean, the immediate obvious modern case comes to mind where everyone's saying, you know, live in your truth or speak your truth or yes. everyone's got their own truth. And it's, it immediately boils down to this. Oh, well, there is no truth. Do whatever you want. It's just a nihilistic, you know, dog eat dog free for all. Um, yes. How else do you. But, but there's a crypto thing in there too. Please. Because. And this is his point. Your truth, my truth leads to an nihilism, which leads to an absolute unquestioned ontology. Nihilism is this is the this is the way things really are, and you can't question it. So that's I mean, that's what he means about this, right? You're right to point to nihilism, but you, you what he's saying is that nihilism becomes itself a profound dogmatism that can't even recognize itself as a dogmatism because it thought it was rejecting all dogmatisms. You get this very much with Nietzsche, hmm. uh, who's trying to break out of dogmatisms, but he ends up becoming, in many ways, and you know, and I can I can hear all my friends who um, are, are 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 love Nietzsche, and Nietzsche is an important thinker. He's one of the great prophets of the meaning crisis, but you know, Nietzsche ultimately needs a place, right? He's got he, he, so he has the will to power, which becomes the ontological basic thing. Right, it, and you get you get so, and, it, and it's the same. Right, it's the same, when you try to move away dogmatism into relativism, just like you did, you can collapse into a fundamental dogmatism. In fact, that's his point. It leads that way, and then the re, and the reverse is also the case. As you try to move away from relativism, right, you can then fall prey to mistaking some part as being the total of the whole. You can confuse right 
it, totality and become totalitarian with infinity, which always reminds you of the humility of your finitude. And so that, uh, that's what I would say is, is the point. He's, and, we, and, and his point is these two things that see each other as you know, vicious you know, enemies, right? They actually are like this. They are, they, are, they are mutually causing and affording each other in powerful ways. Yeah, and then we're, we're back to that, you know, truth and relationship thing, right? There's not, there, there may be an absolute, but it's not something we can get our words around necessarily. And um, that would imply, well, I don't want to jump ahead too much because that was another <laughs> mind-blowing thing of the book is that the absolute and the relative are not set against each other. No. The, abs the absolute transcends and encompasses the relative. Yes, and it has to. And it has to, and that, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, that will connect with some recent stuff that he doesn't invoke, but I've been talking about the contrast between the hermeneutics of beauty, which he is deeply uh, talking about, and the hermeneutics of suspicion, um, which is the, the hermeneutics of suspicion is the idea that appearances are always distorting and distracting, and that the truth is to reveal the secret agenda, reveal the conspiracy, reveal the cabal, reveal the blah, 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 whatever, right? Uh, uh, where, and, and the point that Schindler is going to make and other people of Marlo Ponti and Plato make is it can't, that can't be the primary case, right? If appearance is, right? When, and whenever I say, ah, oh, that appearance was deceptive, I do it because some other experience is real. These are contrastive terms to say, oh, that's an illusion requires that I say, this is real. It makes no sense to say everything's an illusion. That, that, that makes no sense. There's always some crypto thing that is being the standard of, uh, when people say everything's an illusion, they often mean, but my consciousness is real or my consciousness alone is real or something like that. And so what that means is the hermeneutics of suspicion is not primary. It is parasitic on the hermeneutics of when appearance discloses reality, when the, when the relative and the absolute, when the appearance and the real are actually in ratio and religio together. And when, when do appearances disclose reality in that way that humbles us and calls us towards more, that's beauty. That for Schindler is beauty. Yeah. For which, Plato, yeah. yeah, beauty and then back, you know, the elegance of the formula again, right? There's a beauty it, yes, there. That, yeah, yes. makes sense. Um, just on, since we're on here now, I'll just mention one other thing that occurs to me. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's correct thinking or not, but I've conceptualized the absolute as that which is unchanging, right? Mm -hmm. it, and the relative is that which is changing. That's how we perceive things yes. that are relative. They're changing against one another. And maybe this is somewhat of a primary paradox, perhaps, that the only thing that seems to be unchanging in this universe of ours is change. Yeah. <laughs> so um I, I, it's but there's a danger there where you start to think you don't want to relativize the absolute you know the That's absolute right. is above and transcendent of this but it, it's somewhat in that identity of you know the only thing that's unchanging is change itself that maybe we we have this tendency to flip to flip that and relativize the absolute versus absolutizing the relative i'm, I'm not not sure if i'm saying that right no i think you are i think you are. um Anyways, and just that, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to compliment you. I, I appreciate the fact, like with this, like, like we are literally trying to come to terms. Think with what that phrase literally means. We are trying to come to terms with you know stuff that's very hard to to get clear on. And so you know, you know, playing around with this and 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 doing what you're doing is exactly part of engaging in uh, the dialectical process, dialectical in Plato's sense, not Hegel's sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so for Plato, I mean, I don't want to skip ahead about what, you know, what's the good and, and stuff like that, but um, there is something, and, and this, this is what Plato wants to say, 
right? There is change, and, and Plato's deeply influenced by Heraclitus, but he's also deeply influenced by Parmenides. In fact, one way of understanding Plato, <laughs> this is like a recipe for Plato, it's somewhat humorous, but you, you take Heraclitus and you take Parmenides and you glue them together with Socrates, um, that's basically. And so Heraclitus is everything is in flux. And people, that's right, but you have to listen more carefully to Heraclitus, right? right? Heraclitus says that there is a logos within any flux. So, and, right, and so what Heraclitus is saying is there, it's not a cacophony of absolute unintelligible chaos. There is constant logos. There is intelligibility running through it all. And so that's what Plato wants to put his finger on. Right, and then that's what he gets from Parmenides, the other great influence, the pre-Socratic influence, the, the idea that there has to be some way in which thinking and being can conform, or or there or, or there's no way of knowing at all. Um, there's a lot more to Parmenides than that, but that's one key lesson. And so Plato is saying yes, but within the flux, and then he he makes use of Heraclitus's notion of the logos we can find a through line. We can find that the, the promise of intelligibility keeps being kept. And there must be a source for that, right? That the promise keeps being kept. There must be some, there's a constancy to the intelligibility that binds together the flux of change. And so, right, that through line is the through line that, points, points, leads, weaves to the whole, right? And that's, so for Plato, I, I want to give a concrete instance of this. That might be helpful, it, it, right? So here's an object. I'm, go, I'm going to be going to Rafe Kelly's return to the source. So I'm getting all of the equipment for being out in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the forest and stuff. So I got a flashlight, right? Now, notice when I do that, you go, oh, yeah. No, but notice something. Let's do it. Let's do it. Can you actually ever fully see a flashlight? In fact, can you fully see all the things that a flashlight can do? So not only can you never fully see a flashlight, you can't ever fully actualize all the various things it can do, nor can you actualize all the potential ways in which it can enter into relationship to other things. Yes? Right. But notice as I move through all of those aspects, it's like a melody. I get this from John Rusin, who's also deeply influenced by Plato, right? There, there's, there's like, there's a through line. Each aspect is not, this aspect isn't identical to this, uh, but they belong together. They fit together. This use and this use. And this is what Plato's trying to get. He's trying to get all the ways in which something is many, that's the relative, are also somehow bound with how it's, right? It's also one. Now, here's the thing, Robert, and here's the thing that Plato's trying to get us to realize. Here's the multi aspectuality all the multiple aspects, the multi aspectuality all the multiple acts, all the multiple actualizations, all the multiple perspectives, all the multiple relations. I'm trying to symbolize it by doing this, right? And there's a through line, but the through line is not any particular aspect or any particular use or any particular relation because that, it is that which, which binds all the aspects, all the acts, and all the relations together. So it is not a thing, but it is that which makes the thing knowable by wanting all the minis of any thing. Right? And so the absolute is about the synoptic integration. It's about finding the through line and getting a sense of how it goes into an infinity, but it never stops. But I can't capture it in any aspect, act, or relation because it transcends them all. Did that help as a more yeah, concrete a lot, Extremely. Um, and 
I'm reminded you talk about the structural functional organization, right? Where you, you could put a bunch of feathers and a beak and some legs and a cup and throw it in the air, but that doesn't make it a bird, right? There's, right. there's coherence between the elements. Yeah, there's a through line going through all of the features that binds them into the gestalt. Mm -hmm. And then there's a through line binding all the gestalts, right? Of right. all the aspects and so on and so on. And you get this sort of almost fractal sense. Mm -hmm. And that, right? And so you get the ever proliferating mini, but the ever continuous through line, the unity, the one. But it's not a numerical unity, it's not a logical unity. It's the, it's close. And this is why he says the soul is akin to the forms. Your unity as a person isn't that you're somehow mathematically identical to how you were as a two year old. That's ridiculous. It's that all of the, there's been a, there's been a through line, all the different aspects, all the different changes, all the different features, all the different skills and virtues, vices and virtues. And right, there's a through line that runs them all together. And we try to, to, you know, and we realize, remember you went and said this, that's a no thingness. I can't actually, if I try to say there's myself, Hume famously failed, because you can't, because it isn't anything you can see. It binds together all the possible seeings. Yeah, the, the, I guess the maybe <laughs> closest word for that through line is a story, right? Or a narrative or um it, related it, it, to the logos perhaps where you're gathering all these yeah. elements under one term called the flashlight or the bird whatever it is yeah yes yeah. it's like a story and 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 a story is a good thing in that a story reminds you of non-logical identity right in, in which there can be development and change and multiple aspects character development and yet there is right a, 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 an identity there so non -log we, we, we narrative is a good way of getting familiar. Mythos is a good way of getting familiar with non-logical identity. But what Plato wants to say is, right, mythos and, 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 right, and, and logos, right, they, they're actually, they, they're, 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 it's a little bit more complicated than that, but what, what the, that the through line of the flashlight is like a story, but it's also not like a story. Right, because it's not a story; it's a flashlight, right? And you, and so you, you, you. It's a good metaphor, and that's why Plato will he'll do this thing where he'll use myth to try and explain the logos, uh, because he knows that when people can follow a story, like the story of the cave that's in the Republic, right, that that helps them to find a through line that's not, uh, you know, a logical computation. But then he tries to encourage them to okay, but now let go of it being a story, right? Because you, now you're trying to totalize it again. Try to see the, a story as just yet another way of, of a, 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 just one way among many a, a, in which the logos unfolds. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a great point there. Um, I just, just to say this one point too, I've always been deeply confused <laughs> when I get into these deep conversations or talk about philosophy and that I'm not sure if we are trying to explain cognitive software or consciousness, or we're describing the out there cosmos, but it seems like, you know, there, there are deep correspondences or between the two. Yes. Um, and so again, I come back to this relational thing that there, there's no thing necessarily. It's all this, relationalness we're using to create things i think the buddhist called it codependent origination right? yes it's, yeah yeah and, and but the uh, but the buddhists um also are, are they they um and i mean this in a positive sense the way plato struggles with it the buddhists also struggle with trying to find right the dharma the through line through that runs through all the samsaric moments and all the samsaric appearances um and, and um so, yeah, that, that, I, I think that question to me is actually not a tangential question. The question, are we talking about uh, human reason or are we talking about uh, the way reality is laid out? But what Schindler is trying to argue on behalf of Plato is we shouldn't be separating those. In fact, the, the, the best explanation of how we, right, 
um, gain knowledge in, the, in that broader sense that Plato was talking about, knowledge that leads to wisdom, right, is to say, no, 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 these two are right, bound together in, in a, a really powerful way. Plato was the, one of the inspirations for me um, at this level, and then Marlo Ponti at another level, for the notion of transjectivity, uh, uh, of right. the notion of, of the way in which, right? And Plato taught, and that's what I, was, what I was trying to allude to a minute ago. He talks about there's a deep affinity between the soul, the psyche, and the forms, the through lines, right? And, and that's because your soul is a kind of, your, your, is the through line of your psychosomatic existence. And that gives you a profound sense of, right, uh, of the, it gives you a way of participating in the through line of other things. You know them not just by representing them, you know them by also instantiating the same thing that they're doing. So you're both participating in the same process and principles. Um, and then the thing to realize is, yes, your autobiography is a through line for your yourself or your soul. But in mindfulness, you can discover non-autobiographical through lines. There's other deeper ways in which there's a through line. Um, and this is why people will often talk in mindfulness about finding their true self or their no self, but it, it, it is somehow also their essential self that's below the autobiographical narrative level. Yeah, brilliantly said. Um, maybe quickly useful just to mention you mentioned transjectivity that might throw some people for a loop i know we've talked about it before but i love your example of just describing the transjective nature of adaptivity itself yes right? yes it's, it's not in subject it's not an object maybe you could just give that 30 second spiel just so people because i think well, transjectivity well, all, is essential to this entire book that we're talking about it, I, I think so too i think so too um Notice that the notion of adaptivity has ratio and religio built into it. It is a coming together because to be adaptive is to be properly proportioned, fitted, right? But that means also to be rightly connected to the environment. Like the notion of adaptivity brings in ratio and religio. And so when we talk about the adaptivity of an organism, the adaptivity of an organism is not in the organism and it's not in the environment. It's about the the ratio religio the proper fittedness between the organism and the environment so they can mutually shape mutually conform each other and so that the organism is capable of solving problems within that environment so the adaptivity of the great white shark immediately disappears when you drop it into the sahara desert so it's not in the organism it's not in the environment it's in the way in which they are coupled together and that's harkens back to the way a romantic couple is coupled together. Right. Yeah, yeah, this domain dependence, perhaps even yep. a path dependence to it. Um, okay, I think that's very important. I just wanted to have you highlight that real quick. So jumping back to mythology, um, he, the author Schindler goes through a few of the mythological habits. habits. That's a great, great part of the book. Eh? That's such a practical thing that he does. In, in a strong sense of practical. I, yeah. I really love that. Yeah, I agree. And it, yeah, I think it just highlights a lot of the problems. And there, there's, a, there's a through line between them as well, yeah, yeah. which I think is interesting. Yeah. So I'll just read them quickly here. He writes that first, and he's naming the four, uh, what should I call these? Four certain cultural habits that evince a trivialization of reason and its yeah. claims. Yes. And he's enumerating four of such habits in contemporary Western culture. He says, first, perhaps the most obvious cultural habit is the general tendency toward pragmatism. One claims that, quote unquote, talk is cheap. There is a rush to, quote unquote, cash out ideas to determine their application. And this application is considered to be what justifies them taking the time, taking the time to reflect on them because making pragmatic considerations Determinative means breaking off inquiry the moment it ceases to produce some praxis, meaning action. We may appropriately call this tendency a habit of intellectual impatience. And that is the through line between the four years is intellectual impatience. Yes. I second, agree. One, well, yeah. second one, he says, there is moreover a pervasive tendency in contemporary Western culture toward abstraction. 
understood in this context to mean the isolation of one aspect of an issue from others and to to treat that aspect as complete within itself. Connected with this isolation of particular aspects is a disproportionate valuation of expertise and specialization and a subsequent fragmentation of thought in and about the public order. Third, related to the first two points and in a certain respect their practical synthesis is a tendency to absolutize technology as a response to problems. Fourth, finally, there's a tendency to reduce thinking to politics, meaning for our purposes, the manipulation of and by opinion, rather than the study of the nature of the human community. So, again, Schindler identifies intellectual impatience as the through line between um, these four modern cultural habits. And I think I brought this topic up to you in our last discussion, just the the economic concept of time preference. Yes. Where the lower your time preference, the longer term thinking you are and the yeah. higher, it's a little bit counterintuitive because the higher time preference, the shorter term thinking you are. Yeah. And the, the Austrians also identified this with morality, basically like the, the lower you can get the aggregate time preference of a civilization is to say the more moral or more civilized it is. Yes. Um, and it's, without going down the economics rabbit hole, a lot of that's related to capital accumulation. Like the more capital we have in the world, the more buffer we have against uncertainty, the more, um, the more wealth we have, frankly. So we have more leisure to engage in this longer term thinking and planning process. Yes. Is it possible that this modern intellectual impatience is related to time preference? And, and I, I'm not trying to, push you into the economics conversation, no, no, no. but just like how I would just like to hear your thoughts about it in general. Well, first of all, thank you for the, the care in which you're engaging in our, our dialogue. I appreciate that. That's uh, that's one of many reasons why I wanted to come back and talk with you again. Um, well, I'll learn from the best, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the um, that economic principle, I think, matches quite readily to hyperbolic discounting. That's a phenomena discussed in uh, psychology, cognitive science. Ainsley's work is pivotal, or, or you know, on this. Um, but there's been lots of work around it. Um, I talked. To, uh, I talked about this in the role of the imaginal, and the, the talk I gave at Cambridge about integrating the rational and the ritual. Uh, and I hope we get to that at, at some point. Um, but to return to your point, hyperbolic discounting is cross species, which means it's an adaptive trait. So from pigeons to primates, to foxes, to whales, to, right, you can find evidence. I don't know if they've got it for whales, but I'm just saying, right? You've got evidence for hyperbolic discounting. Um, and, it, and that means it, it has an adaptive function. Um, and the adaptive function is to try, okay, so what does it mean? It means, Ceteris paribus, and the ceteris paribus we're going to have to return to, but ceteris paribus, I will find a current stimulus way more salient than a future stimulus, regard right. independent of whatever absolute value it might have for me. Okay, uh, and so you, and the reason for that, I would argue, why it's adaptive is, right, the probability of events de decreases exponentially as you move from the present to the future, right? Um, and so hyperbolic discounting, and please listen to the language I'm using, is a way of proportioning your attention so you give attention to things proportional to their probability of occurring. It has that adaptive value. So if you didn't have hyperbolic discounting, you would be overwhelmed by the consideration of low probability events. I think I gave that example of, you know, if I get out of bed, I might twist my ankle. And if I twist my ankle, I might be slower getting to my classes. And that means I might not, you know, understand the lectures and I might not pass the course and I might fail my degree and then I won't get my job and I'll en en end up in Buffalo married to a lamp or something like that, right? And so, you, you, in fact, if you don't have, I would say, you can make sort of a theoretical prediction, if you don't have a capacity for hyperbolic discounting, you will be overwhelmed by general anxiety. In fact, I think part of what's going on in general anxiety disorder is uh, a, a reduction in the adaptive functioning of hyperbolic discounting. Okay, 
Now, first of all, two points about that. One point I want to make, because we're going to, I've made it before, but we'll keep coming back to it. It's processes that make us adaptive also make us subjective to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. Because the problem with hyperbolic discounting is it's adaptive. What it does is it screens off all of these future events, each one which has a low probability of occurring. Let me use an example I used last time because it might, it might be helpful. I don't smoke, but I smoke. Let's say I smoke this. Uh, do I smoke this next cigarette? Present stimulus. Well, if I smoke it, it might lead to a chain of events where I die in Hamilton in my left lung of cancer or in Hamilton in my right lung of cancer or Toronto in my left lung, Toronto in my right lung, in Burlington of emphysema. Like there's all these different possible premature deaths. They're individually of low probability. Right? And so hyperbolic discounting turns my attention away from them because they're all individually low in probability. But what it does, and think about the through line, it misses what is in common for all of these events, namely premature death. And I'm not that fussy about death. I want to avoid premature death, not just this death in Hamilton or this death in Toronto or this death in Burlington or this death in Montreal, et cetera, right? And so hyperbolic discounting, it's very adaptive nature also makes you procrastinate. That's why you procrastinate. That's why it's hard for you to lose weight. That's for, it's why it's hard for you to, to, for save, to save for your retirement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you don't wanna shut off hyperbolic discounting. And this is in the Republic, by the way, this is the man and the lion and the monster, and we, right? We'll come back to that, right? You don't want to shut that off, but you, you have to figure out how to get the different components of the psyche working together. And one of the jobs of reason is to reproportion your attention, what you're finding salient, so that you can see the whole and pursue the long-term goals that are necessary for the acquisition of knowledge, the cultivation of wisdom, etc. Yeah, brilliantly said. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. I'll say this because I think it ties into the next point too, where he talks about how, how rationality can, when it fails, what happens. But um, in that economic sense, you know, the printing of money is something that increases people's time preference, which would, I think yes. the equivalent saying this is to reduce their hyperbolic discounting. I'm, I might no, have that it, in- no, no, you've got no, it increases their hyperbolic. Uh, increases, okay. So they, 
right, right, right. So they get they get more locked into like present. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Shrinking their time horizon, you might say. Yes, yes, yes. Which you said that was the kind of the bulwark against this general non-specific anxiety. So you're actually increasing general non-specific anxiety when you reduce people's time preference, right? Well, no, when you when you're doing like the, the, uh, let, let me get clear because I might have confused you. Mm. I think hyperbolic discounting prevents us from being terrorized by all of the possibilities in the future, right? right. And so, breaking the horizon has a value, but we have to, and this is one of the ways in which re reason is the reason corrects the mistakes that fall out from the natural use of our adaptive intelligence. Having hyperbolic discounting is an adaptive thing, but it, because it protects you from being overwhelmed by paying too, attention to all of these minuscule possibilities, right? But it also blinds you to whatever is shared by all of those. And so to the degree to which printing money moves people into that, they are going to lose the capacity and think about Schindler here to see the whole picture and see what runs through all of these low probability events that might therefore have a significant probability to them. So each one of those deaths that I want to avoid, right, I, I don't look at because they're very low probability, but the through line is death. Right. What reason can do, reason can get you aware, right, the contemplative reason can reproportion your attention, theoria, so you, theoria, so you can see into the depths and see, oh, wait, the way I'm framing this, the way my natural intelligence is framing this is actually blinding me to what is in common, what is part of the whole, and therefore blinding me from pursuing a greater reality. I pursue a lesser reality in favor in contrast to and in favor to, right, a greater reality. And in that sense, it's exactly what you're talking about. Did that, did that help? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. You know, this is so out of left field, but uh, it came up, so I'll say it. There's this old story, I don't even recall what country it was in, in World War I or World War II, but basically these fighter jets or fighter planes, I guess, rather, were coming back and the maintenance people would examine the planes that came back and they saw where the bullet holes were under the plane. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And they think, okay, wow, we need to reinforce these points where the planes were shot <laughs> until one of the guys realized, like, no, actually, the planes that returned, the bullet holes that we see, this is these planes were hit and survived. So yeah, it's the places that holes. weren't shown yeah. that they actually yeah. needed to reinforce because all those planes were left out of the data set, basically. So it's almost right. like human reason, you know, human reason overcame the perception in a way to, to get closer to truth. Exactly. And I, I like this proposal. I hadn't put these two together. Uh, so first of all, I, I, now that we've explored ex explicating and explaining it, I want to I want to step back and appreciate your proposal. Uh, I mean, I've made this connection in other places about Plato, uh, especially with talking about the man, the lion and the monster about overcoming hyperbolic discounting. But I hadn't connected it specifically to Schindler's argument about mythology and intellectual impatience is a, a sort of fundamental failure, right, of overcoming hyperbolic discounting, temporal discounting within. So you're failing, you're failing the, the, maybe one of the central tasks of reason, which is, a, is using intelligence to correct the errors that intelligence creates. Like, like it, 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 reason is this reflective capacity in which I try to take note of the errors that are being caused by my problem-solving intelligence. I, I like, and that's why, that, yeah, cut, yeah. Everything he, sorry, that's really good, Robert. That's really good. Mythology and intellectual impatience and hyperbolic discounting. Because I think, I, I think one of the reasons why reason evolved, contemplative reason, theoria, is so that we could see into the depths, so that we could overcome the inevitable self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior of adaptive hyperbolic discounting. I think that's one of its evolutionary origins, but I, like, I hadn't put it, thank you. That's really good. I well, like that a lot. 
you're quite welcome. I'm not sure I entire follow, entirely follow it all, but I'm so happy to have that. Uh, to see the look of revelation on your face. I feel really good about that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll jump back into an excerpt here real quick. And I think this ties into what we're just talking about. Um, Schindler writes, to the extent that rationality is not per se good, it will have to appeal to something outside of itself in order to acquire any capacity to move. While the threat or use of physical force is an extreme option for the supplement to reason, other options ultimately differ from it merely in degree rather than in kind. Manipulation is always, however subtly, a form of violence. Yeah. And so just to tie this into the printing, the money printing thing, you know, rationality, I think we express it in language largely. And I mentioned this to you last time, but, you know, we often talk about the logos being expressed in speech kind of in, in common uh, parlance today, but we fail to, to mention that prices are another really important coordinating mechanism. Right? Yes, like you don't, yeah. you don't need the information about what happened with the copper mine in Argentina. You just need yeah. to know the price of copper went up and you adjust. Yeah. Right. Yes. So it's, it's, um, and the price actually is, it's funny enough, it's an exchange ratio, right? It's a, it's a ratio of exchange between two goods expressed in money. So it is, it's got ratio built right into it. And I, my, my question here is like, it, it doesn't seem like it's any coincidence then that aspiring totalitarians, they always strive to establish control over the media apparatus, and then they always try to monopolize the money. Yes. So is, is this perhaps misology yeah. attacking the transjective tools we use? I mean, we're using you know, yeah. language to get fit to one another and fit to reality and prices to do something similar. Is there a connection yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's deep connections, especially to what we talked about last time with bullshit and how bullshitting is different from lying uh, because it's about, it's, it's about making things super salient at the expense of um, how they help us to track and, and connect to reality. Um, so I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, uh, like, if you, don't, if you don't find the ratio religio to reality to be per se good, Right, it, 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 right, because that's what he's arguing via Plato. Reason is, reason is just that ratio religio to real. What's real, right? What's most real? If you don't regard that as being intrinsically good, then you've already lost everything that is important uh, that we've been talking about here about contemplative reason. And then what's going to happen is, right? Reason is now something that has to be, as he said, moved or pushed by something else. And so, yeah, I, I think I think that's the fundamental move. I think that's I, I, again, that's very good. I think the fundamental move of towards totalitarianism is a preponderance of bullshit, also called propaganda, also called other things, that's designed to enhance. And this is why fear or greed are things that are usually offered by the totalitarian. Right, in order to enhance the hyperbolic discounting, in order to make us incapable of seeing in depth. Because if we see in depth, we will be able to see through the dictator. We will right. be able to see through, right? So I think what you've just said makes, make, makes perfect sense. Um, and, and, and the problem that Schindler is pointing to here is this is starts way before we've got some political party or cabal. Well, we've got well, in the general diminishment, this is like one of the key points in the general reduction from contemplative to computational, ultimately to just communicative, where I'm just trying to manipulate you, right? That is happening ubiquitously and insidiously before there's any particular political party or socioeconomic cabal but it's already sown all of the seeds and made all of that much more possible. So this sounds like, oh, these people just talking on about reason, blah, 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 blah. But Schindler's point and Plato's point, right, is when you lose the contemplative, when you lose contemplative reason, you start down a trail that makes you more and more susceptible to individual and collective bullshit 
which is the trail towards totalitarian regimes of one kind or another. And Plato was, Socrates resisted both a democratic, to, like to talk, a tyranny and, and an oligarchic tyranny. And so Plato wasn't, right, uh, he, he, he was really well aware of this, this mythology preparing the ground for totalitarianism. Yeah, and it seems to be related to some type of myopia or short-sightedness too, and that yes. you know you're really just the, the totalitarian just wants to control the media or the narrative and the money to benefit their immediate self-interest, but it yes. in the long run destroys the cohesion of the community because yeah you can't people can't hold themselves together, but it maybe even perhaps even deeper because I think maybe this ties back to the frame problem too, where it sort of happens, it can happen in your own mind, right? If you take a particular frame of yours to be final, like this is yes. my frame, I'm dogmatically attached to it, it doesn't bend, rather than the process of framing itself being more fundamental, right? I yes. think you called it trans framing earlier, yes. that you yes. can, I mean, you can, you know, tyrannize yourself or tyrannize your family or what, or you can't have very much good conversations very much. with people, so um and, and then we get radically confused we think the impulsivity of uh, of the superficially present is a kind of freedom when in fact what we've lost is uh, the defining feature of our agency which is to look towards the deep consequences of our behavior and change our beha change our behavior so as to avoid those consequences and so when we lose when we when we make, we, and, and we're falling into that mistake, we're falling into the mistake that sort of, in, 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 like the impulsive gratification of, uh, of sort of superficial fears and desires is the same thing as freedom, then you're exactly right. We, we have, we've already sold our soul into a kind of myopia that, right, the dictator wins if he can make everybody as impulsive as him and convince everybody that their impulses depend on his impulses. Right. Yeah. Which destroys the adaptivity of the collective, right? It can no longer it's adapt. And, and, the, and the individual it destroys yeah. both. Right? right. So, I mean, and, and this is the problem, I mean, right. In the totalitarian regime, everybody, everybody distrusts everybody else and you get just increasing webs of suspicion and surveillance. Right. Right? And then, like you said, the individual gets more and more torn within themselves uh, between the attempt to pursue long-term goals and whatever the impulsivity of the regime is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Hayek says this well, too, that no matter how perfect your central plan is, that as you progress over time, reality is constantly changing. So the plan yeah. deviates from reality, even if it's perfectly mapped to reality to begin with, it's going to deviate from reality over time. So more and more people become treasonous, more and more people become defectors from the plan. Um, yes, I, I so, agree, I agree. Yeah. That's another instance of the realization that no formal system, no formalization will be sufficient. And that if it claims to total, if it claims totality, it will actually cut us off from our finite re relationship with infinity. I guess with all, all that background on the the modern misconceptions of reason, dogmatism, mythology. Uh, Schindler then goes into the significance of Plato, why why Plato matters. Yes. And um, I'll just read one excerpt here. He says the key claim in the Republic, and it will be the central focus of this book, is that the idea of the good is the unhypothetical first principle of knowledge just as it is the cause of being and truth. Reason as reason is therefore rooted most fundamentally in goodness. This means more than just that reason is good and that what is reasonable is also good, though of course it also means these things. As we will see, the claim means that reason is a kind of desire for goodness and thus has its proper end in the order governed by the good. Mm -hmm. um and let me see here 
Uh, okay, so let me just read one more here. The ultimate foundation of reason, then, will be a principle whose certainty stems from the very fact that it cannot be demonstrated, that is, because it lies at the basis of all other demonstrations. This unhypothetical first principle, Aristotle says, using the very words Plato uses to characterize the good, is what has become known as the quote-unquote principle of contradiction. The same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject in the same respect. That was a bit of jumping around there. Those excerpts are from different pages, but just two that struck me. Um, now that we're introducing the concept, the Platonic concept of the good, maybe it would be a good time to have you, <laughs> good time to have you explain that to us. Um, yeah. And yeah. is it, you know, where I struggle is like, is this an act? Is, is this an actual metaphysical entity? I mean, I know entity is probably not the right word, but, or is this, again, are we just describing some uh, adjective right. of, of being? Um, yep. right. no, good. And, and then good. I would love to hear you speak to the contradictory nature of it. Yeah, I, I want to read the one other quote, uh, just to, so we, we make sure we're not landing on Aristotle. While Aristotle's foundation of reason is the contentless principle of contradiction, Plato's is the good, which is at once the root of all desire, reason, and being. So uh, Schindler's actually being a little bit critical of Aristotle that, that he sort of missed something um, central in Plato. Um, and, and there's one set, I mean, Aristotle's not guilty of this, but there's one sense in which Aristotle's elevation of logic is going to start the ball rolling towards the computational account of reason, reason as logic. So the logos is going to get reduced uh, to, to logic. Okay, so this idea about the good, let's start for where people are probably going to start because it is a, a fragmentation of a whole, a W H O L E. So, and this is Habermas's uh, point, and part of the problem of modernity and post modernity is that we have these three and Kant did this with sort of the three critiques, we have these three autonomous kinds of normativity. We have the true, the good, and the beautiful. And we, when we hear good, we hear it as just having to do with ethics. And when we hear true, we have it just I mean just to do with science and knowledge. And with beautiful, uh, the beautiful, we think of just aesthetics and art. And we think they are autonomous. And, you know, and because autonomy is the big, the big deal of the of the enlightenment, how things are autonomous, how reason is autonomous, right? How art is autonomous, right? Um, and, and so the problem with that is that's a fragmentation. So I, I, what I'm, why, why, why is John doing it? Well, because we have reduced the good to the ethical good. And what I'm trying to first do is ask you to challenge that frame. So first thing to consider, sort of a cognitive science thing, when you're making normative judgment, normativity means any kind of these judgments, right? When you're making normative judgments about the true or the good or the beautiful, you're not using fundamentally different parts of your brain, right? So you're, right, there's a sense in which underneath them all is, right, the way in which they're one, the way in which the true, the good, and the beautiful all interpenetrate each other. Now, if you go before the modern period, we get the exact opposite of what we have now. We have these three things fragmented out. If you look all the way through even to Aquinas, you have what's called the convertible of these, that the good, the true, and the beautiful completely interdepend and define, on each, define each other. And you go, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, do you think it's good to pursue the truth? I bet you do. In yes. fact, how would you justify pursuing the true if it isn't good? And we've already noted, can you pursue the true without having the beautiful, without having the proper relationship of appearance to reality? Of course you can't. And as soon as you start thinking on these things, and this is, you know, this other book, The Catholicity of Reason, right? Uh, and also Love in the Postmodern Predicament by Schindler. He's making this argument for, try to do this. Our modern, no our, our notion of the isolated good of ethics the isolated beauty of aesthetics and the isolated truth of 
epistemology, look through them and beyond them to what they, the, the whole that they are. Is that making sense? I've tried to show you how, you know, you can't pursue the true without it being good, without the beautiful, but right, the beautiful is the proper alignment of the appearance with the reality, et cetera. They all interpenetrate and interdefine. And so you have to move outside of the merely, sorry for that adjective, uh, the merely moral or ethical notion of goodness. First, that's the first move you have to make. So we're talking about something that is an ontological goodness. It's something that is the common source of truth, goodness, and beauty, and binds them together and get, creates a through line between them all. So that's the first move you have to make. You have to do that transframing. You have to step out of the modern fragmentation and try and see back towards the whole, not the totality, but the whole. Okay, then what might that through line of through lines be, right? It's the fact that I would argue is maybe it's the meta fact, something I, I, I mentioned earlier. It's not something I could demonstrate to you. It's not something that I can, right? I, it's, I can't demonstrate it to you by giving you an argument. I can't demonstrate it to you by giving you a beautiful piece of music. I can't demonstrate it to you in one, in one sense, right? By doing a, a virtuous act because it is that which makes all of them intelligible and possible, right? They presuppose it. And what might that presupposition be? Here's the idea. The good is the, is the, the, the continually kept promise that the depths of intelligibility, the depths of how the mind is trying to make sense. Well, when I say intelligibility, I mean like adaptivity, it's between the mind and the world. The depths of intelligibility and the depths of reality stay wedded together. We never, we never move to another aspect that it never falls into a, a cacophony, right? Be, so we use intelligibility as our fundamental guide for how real something is. When, if, why is, what, what, and Plato uses this later in the cave, why is the shadow less real than the thing that casts the shadow? Because I use the thing that, I can use my understanding of the thing that casts the shadow to explain the shadow, and I can't do the, the, I can't do the reverse. There's an asymmetric dependence of intelligibility. The shadow depends on the object in a way the object's intelligibility does not depend on the shadow. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So we use, right, we use these dependency relations of intelligibility to decide what is more real. Real is always a contrast term. What is more real? And what, what we're then, what we're, what we're banking on, what we're betting on, what we're being, but, but also what we're loving and being faithful to is that that never seems to fail. Intelligibility, the through line of intelligibility seems to be able to, right, when we're exercising reason, theoria, contemplative reason, when we are being rational in that sense, the through line of intelligibility and the through line of reality don't come apart. That's the ultimate rejection of skepticism or solipsism. And you, and you say to me, John, you, well, you can't get, you give me an argument for that. And then you've misunderstood. This is, this is Plato's point. I, if, I, if I could give you an argument for it, it wouldn't be the, the ultimate thing upon which all argumentation or all artistic production or all virtuous action depends. That's the good. It's not, it's not, more, it's like I said, try to take your notions of goodness, beauty, and truth, and look through all three of them, like a triangulation into the depths. And then what you're seeing is that there, it, that being and logos, ont, ontos and logos stay wedded together. 
and everything else, every other ability to make some kind of judgment depends on that. Because if that pulls apart the way the skeptic or the, 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 the skeptic claims or the mythologist sort of dis, uh, uh, degenerates into, then everything else, anything else falls apart. <clears throat> if you don't have the good, you have nihilism. That's the good is that which supports your loving faithfulness to the real. And it's as much a part of being as it is a part of logos. Did that help? That's a really hard thing. To no, I know it's extremely difficult. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's something you can just keep thinking about because I guess it's sort of beyond thought in a lot of ways. And you're, that's why we're trying to, to multiply act as spectralize it right see it from different exactly. angles yeah so so look at look at and i was ta i was talking to some physicists early or today science presupposes the intelligibility of reality science considers itself to be progressing and self-correcting precisely because it has an ongoing faith in in this kind of ontological goodness that reality is intelligible now, there's no scientific experiment or argument I can run to show you that. Right. It is a fundamental presupposition for why science succeeds and progresses. That's just one instance of the good. So this is an axiom, right? Yes. I guess of, of science, perhaps, uh, th this, that there is it's a... Well, it's, it's an axiom of the ancient meaning of science, scientia, knowledge. It's a, this is Plato's claim that knowledge right, is right, dependent on the good. And if reason is ultimately about this knowing, this contemplative knowing, right, this transformative ecstatic knowing, then right, it, re, reason is, is, is bound uh, to this love of the good. Yeah, so this this ultimate axiom, in a way, perhaps to of scientia, as you said, okay. um, that there is a, I guess, a perfect fidelity between intelligibility and reality. There's a uh, fidelity as long, and, and that's a beautiful word to use. As long as you don't conflate fidelity with accuracy or certainty, because Plato is not making those enlightenment enlightenment in the european sense of the enlightenment he's not making those he's not seeking computational certainty uh, he's seeking perhaps another kind but he's not seeking that and he definitely doesn't mean accuracy because of what we've been saying and, right so fidelity like ha is harmony or no i like fidelity i like fidelity yeah, no. is, fidelity means like when you're faithful to your your spouse it doesn't mean that you have a total, final, precise, absolutely certain grasp of them. In fact, if you claim that, you will kill your relationship. You will throttle it. What it means is that if you right comport yourself, if you are, if you get ratio religio to this person, you will right. There's a promise that you will be able to go deeper and deeper into them and let them deeper and deeper into you. Reciprocal opening, and that promise will be kept insofar as the relationship is good right 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 so again i maybe this is just a lens that i have but i always find my thinking grounding out kind of in a darwinian worldview to some extent this seems and please i would love to hear your feedback on this where i'm wrong or, or otherwise there's a there seems to be a through line of fitness here as well right that Yes, like beauty, what we tend to find beautiful, typically, you know, a beautiful woman or a beautiful landscape or a beautiful plate of food. It's it's something that, you know, it's fitness points for us, right? If we can get yes. that thing um, with truth, it seems more like the fitness element is innovation, perhaps like the, the more of a grip we can get our knowledge onto reality that e equals MC squared or whatever. It gives us this yes. new 
uh, yep. capability, ability to grasp the world and, and maybe change the circumstances we live in. And then goodness too, seems to be like that intuition. You were saying that guiding intuition for, uh, I forget the, the mathematician you mentioned earlier, where we just thought the mathematics were better, right? There, there was more goodness in them. So is it, is this related to fitness somehow? Or again, if we're asked that earlier question, like, are we describing <laughs> I, I think we are, but uh, but again, uh, I mean, I, 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 one of the things you could you could you could do a skeptical turn and say, right, right, it's evolution and the world is as it is, and we're only seeing it through a very distorting evolutionary lens. Or you can say, well, um, the theory of evolution depends on uh, the true, the good, and the beautiful, and therefore on the good, capital G in order for you to trust it the way you're trusting it in order to make pronouncements on all of the rest of reality. And just, just stop and think about that. What is so good about, well, it's true. It's not just true, it's elegantly true. And, and, and it's a good theory in that it has many of the theoretical virtues, right, et cetera. So in one sense, I agree with you, but I wanna challenge people who will, take that evolutionary argument and then use it to drive a kind of hermeneutics of suspicion and say, no, no, we're trapped inside some kind of simu simulation and we're only, we're, we're only seeing you know, some distorted part of it. When of course, of course, always claiming some other thing is actually giving us access to how the world is, um, because, right? And so, well, the world isn't really like that. Well, how do you know? I mean, and how do you know that evolution is true of the world? Like, like where are those claims coming from? Where are you standing uh, to make those claims? And, and also, here's the thing, we, and Schindler is trying to get us to see this, right? Again, about the part and the whole, right? And at one point I wanna to talk to Spinoza because I think Spinoza gets this most right. But if you think that partial knowledge is not knowledge, if you equate partial knowledge to an illusion, you are really, you are really trapped. Because Plato has another dialogue, the Mino, and it's classic Mino's paradox. It goes like this. Suppose I represent knowledge with just a letter P, some knowledge, right? I'm gonna go searching for that knowledge. I don't have it. Well, if I don't have it, how will I recognize it when I see it? And if I have enough to recognize it, why do I search for it? I already know it. And so it looks like you can't ever learn anything. There's it's Mino's paradox. And the, and the way I think almost everybody comes out of, and Plato gives us that for a reason. You have to consider that partial knowledge is nevertheless a contact with reality. If it is disposed towards seeking the whole. But if you say, oh no, evolution only gives me this, this aspect and this aspect, right? And it's like, okay, but are those aspects veils that I'm trapped behind or are they just aspects and I can gather other aspects and I can start to trace out the true line, the through line uh, of, uh, of reality. So you have to be really, really careful about what you do with this. And what if, and we talked about this last time, Robert, what if some of our best science says, hey, you know, the principles of cognition, they're very, very similar to the principles of evolution. There's variation selection, there's random noise, and there's a reproductive sensory motor cycle. And, you know, and that mimics biological evolution. And I was just talking at the Institute for Art and Ideas with Lee Smolin, and he thinks that there, we can actually apply the evolutionary model Right to fundamental physics uh, that you know, that the universe is actually evolved, and you know it's like wow. If that's the case, then far from this being some truncated thing, it's actually plugging me in potentially to fund the fundamental grammar of reality, like biological and physical. And and then and then you realize, oh yeah, right. If this, if logos and ontos didn't share principles then if they didn't co-participate, then I would be trapped. But maybe they actually fundamentally share principles and therefore I'm in contact. 
That's how I want to respond. So I am very, I think evolution is one, uh, evolution is one of the great theories because it brings together the nomological, the law-like kind of that you get in science and the narrative, the individual causal pathway that you get in history and it brings them together. It's a special kind of theory and it therefore may be disclosing something fundamental about intelligence, life, and even the structures, fundamental structures of physics. And that's wow. exciting. No, it's extremely exciting. And then again, it's it's processual or transjective, right? So yes. it's transcendent yes. of subject object. Yes. Um, yes. I, is that universal Darwinism? Is that what that theory is? Uh, it, it, it may be. I'm not quite sure if there's a single referent when people are using that term. So I, I'm, I'm ignorant of, about how well uh, that term is being used and how tight uh, the definition and usage are. So I, I can't answer that question. Right. I, I do want to just echo back something you said, though, that there is this faith at the hot heart of modern science, right, that you yep. can't dispel. And I've heard you yep. talk about this before, that science maybe I'm mis uh, paraphrasing you here, but like it sort of saws off the branch on which it rests in a way that it can't, it can't explain or justify its own existence. So therefore it's yeah, yeah. dependent on, again, faith in some axiom, I suppose. Well, there's two different ways of answering that and they're both relevant. So thank you for bringing them both up. Uh, if we, if we, if what we mean by faith is this fidelity, right? To transframing the concept to theoria, in contemplative rationality and not the assertion of plausibly false propositions without evidence. But if we mean that fundamental relig ratio religio, yes, science depends on faith in that sense, the way you're faithful to your spouse. I think you're married, aren't right. you? you uh, yeah, right. A girlfriend and a daughter, yep. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but the other thing is, the degree to which we are locked into computational or even communicative, but computational rationality, what we get with science right now, this is part of modernity, is we have a scientific explanation, <clears throat> explanations, but I'm just using it as a worldview, right? We have a scientific explanation of many things uh, but we do not have a scientific explanation of how we generate scientific explanations because we can't fit meaning and truth and goodness and beauty in the deep way we've been talking about them here into that scientific worldview. And I think cognitive science is addressing that problem um, and, and there's hope for us. Uh, so I do think there's two different things. One is... Um, modernity, the enlightenment, and they're not exactly identical. Modernity is more about a sort of Promethean spirit and the enlightenment is more about the autonomy of compute, the, the autonomy and sufficiency of computational reason. And right, that doesn't acknowledge this faithfulness, the fidelity that you, you brought up, but it also has precluded us from putting ourselves, finding ourselves within the scientific worldview in a proper and deep way. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea again, back with the, the enlightenment notion of sort of absolutizing the computational. Yeah. Right. Which is dangerous because it's inherently relative, I guess. And, and um, discounting the, what it reaches into and in the beyond, like there's a faith it's rooted in some axiomatic, or fidelity or faith, whatever we're calling this. Um, that's interesting. And that, yeah. So it just makes you wonder as a post enlightenment human in this world, like how much programming are you inheriting? You know, even your notion of yes, yes. rationality and logic and all of these things. Yeah. So yeah, the, and this is part of what I tried to cover in awakening from the meaning crisis. We have a cultural co cognitive grammar that we think is just the way things have to be or the way they are that um, is often something we can step back and challenge like we're doing now. I mean, the, the, like I said, we have, we have rendered reason ratio and we have reduced logos to logic and ren rendered ratio reason and logic as synonyms. And that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Logic has a role 
within ratio. It is a way of proportioning, right, right, uh, 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 and properly organizing your your proposition so they enter into right kinds of relationship for validity, etc. I, I I don't think I'm not I'm not a romantic. I'm not advocating the abandonment of logic. What I'm challenging is the idea that logic is autonomous and sufficient for rationality. Yeah, well said. Um, I'll read another excerpt here. He writes, um, sorry, I guess I need to back up because he re references something earlier. He writes, if Plato simply intended to express a definite philosophy, why would he employ a form laden with such resilient ambiguity? The straightforward <laughs> style of a treatise or even a monological poem would seem a more reliable route to this end. One of the right. most immediately obvious attributes of a dialogue is its inclusion of a plurality of voices. And there's a footnote here that I think is relevant. He writes that another, in, in the plurality of voices footnote, another is the mimetic aspect, the fact that the author does not speak in his own voice. And he goes on to write, according to this view, the interaction of the various aspects of the dialogue, including not only the multiplicity of perspectives, but also aspects such as concrete setting, the play of character, irony, the deliberately ordered arrangement of arguments, the decisions of gestures, or the decisions and gestures made and the like, gives rise to an insight that would otherwise be unattainable. Yes. So again, thinking through this kind of market process, truth discovery thing, it seems like Plato is showing us that the good can only be discovered or approached I'm not yes. sure which one, which verb, by synthesizing these multiple perspectives, maybe something like, maybe something yes. akin to the scientific method or free market process. And then he encoded that idea of multiple perspectives, like we said earlier, into the structure of the Republic itself. Yes, it is not the dialogic form. Yeah. Yes. And then I also wonder, and I don't know if you've read this book or not, but uh, Rene Girard's things hidden since the foundation of the world he goes no I've, I've read some of his i saw satan fall uh like lightning i've read some of it yeah okay go ahead yeah just to, he has this whole you know thesis on mimesis that humans are yes. basically always mirroring one another and it it yes. leads to ritual and social institution and all of these things and yeah i just wonder i'd love to hear your thoughts on you know i guess plato's synthesis of multiple perspectives um, and then that, that footnote brought up the mimetic aspect. So I was just wondering if, is he trying to, again, include this idea of relational or, or inter, interpersonal mirroring into the, the structure or content of the book? So this, uh, this is the, the time to bring up um, the dialogical and why the dialogue and why the dialogical and what's the relationship between the dialectical and the dialogical. Um, and this is a long thing. Christopher Master Pietro and I are writing a book on it right now. Um, and, and I'm very proud of that work. I think it's some of my best work. And then in addition to the book, Chris and Guy Senstock and I have been putting together uh, workshops in which we take people through you know, meditative training, contemplative training, circling practices, philosophical fellowship, and then into uh, dialectic, into dialogos to turn all of this right into the actual practice of following the logos, dialogos. You know, you know, Socrates, you know, says, you know, we we have to follow the logos. You know, the way we follow a wind, and he's he's also playing on the word spirit there, right? Wind spirit, and we we follow it wherever it goes, right? And and so, an argument, a monological argument, comes to a conclusion, and there's value in this, the treatise. There's value in this, but that does two things. And this is part of the postmodern critique of monological modern reason. It assumes often a single perspective and it drives towards a conclusion that is some claim to have grasped what is essential or the totality of something. And as we've seen, Plato wants to put all of those deeply into question. Now let's consider, right? Something another book that Dan and I read, uh, uh, Mercer, Sperber and Mercier, or is it Mercier and Sperber? I can't remember the order. The Enigma of Reason, 
And part of the critique Dan and I have is it reduces the contemplative to the computational, the computational to the communicative. So putting that aside, so I have a lot of criticism of the first half of the book, but the second half of the book is a review of something that I think is really central to this dialogical notion. So let's take just a standard reasoning task, like the waste and selection task, or some of these right uh, reasoning tasks in which you know well-educated university students reliably fail on the waste and selection. It's a very simple reasoning problem. You can people can look it up. I won't describe it in detail here. When you present it, right, um, you know, only ten percent of people give the right answer. It's often because they it's, it's it's often explained as they they fall prey to confirmation bias, et cetera, et cetera. All of that I don't need to get into right now. P please, I invite people to look it up, read a, read up Wason, W A S O N, the Wason Selection Task. It has it's an, it's, an, it's an entire cottage industry which in cognitive psychology because it has been running since 1966. People keep running these experiments trying to figure out what's going on. Here's one really important variation. When you have individuals, and, th and this is exemplary of many other kinds of experimental results. This is not the only result. I'm using this as a doorway into a whole panoply of empirical evidence that, that they go over in the book, right? So I need that understood. I take the waste and selection task. You do it as an individual, 10% chance of producing the right answer. I now take the same waste and selection task and give it to four people who can talk to each other about it. The solution rate rises to about 80% reliably. Reliably. So you have to ask, well, why? Why? Right? Well, because, well, this is the Vervakian interpretation, which will be controversial because any interpretation of the waste and selection task is controversial because there's a cottage industry around it. But here's the Verveki thing. Because, like we talked about earlier, it's not just you know, propositional manipulation. It's also your perspectival framing. And the thing that other people give you is a way of stepping out of your perspective and the way that perspective makes certain things relevant or salient to you. The best way to transcend your own egocentric biases is through genuinely taking the perspective of another person. So, and this is the contrast I'd like to make between via logos and debate. Debate is I'm going to stay in my perspective and I'm going to use my argumentative abilities to try and destroy your position. Position is our code word for where you take your stand and what your perspective is. But in dialogos, we do something different. You and I right, act as what Socrates says, we're, we're, we're midwives to each other. We help each other to transcend. And we both can get to a place together that we can't get to individually. And before you go, what are you talking about? Think about those really deep life-giving conversations you have where you're talking with somebody and it takes on a life of its own and it takes you into places and insights and realizations you know you couldn't have got to on your own and you didn't even, you weren't planning it and you weren't proposing it as, a, as an argument but you find yourself following the logos until you get deeper into reality than you possibly could in a monological fashion. So this is why Plato is writing the dialogues because dialogos is the process in which we can most reliably enter into that tracing out of the through line that is very hard for us to do on our own. And like I said, this comes into the practicalities of reasoning. And so what questions emerge for me and other people is dialogos is a process you have to find yourself in. If you, if you sat down and say, you and I, we're going to have a, an amazing conversation. It's like, like, it's like walking up to somebody on the street and saying, you and I, we're going to be friends right now. It doesn't work that way, right? But nevertheless, <coughs> are there things we can do? I'm going to use a, 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 a metaphor that comes from Heraclitus and from Plato and Guy and Chris and I use it. 
Dialectic is a set of practices by which we can properly put the logs together. The fire has to take spark and burn on its own, but we can increase the chance of a fire happening. And, and that so we can get into these dialectical practices that afford the, you know, the advent of this sense of the logos carrying all of the participants beyond themselves in that ecstatic contemplative reason. And this is not abstract. You, like, you, you can do this, you can learn to do this. And when you learn to do it, it's, it's, it, it you get an understanding of what Plato is talking about deeper than you can just by reading. Like, you, it's like, it's like, like, it's like if you only read the Kama Sutra and you never actually tried, right, right, up, right? <laughs> right? And, and so, um, so the dialogue is not ornamental, it is not incidental. And by the way, up in, when I was doing undergrad, which is a while ago, right, all of that stuff was thought to be incidental. All that mattered was let's extract the propositions and run the arguments monologically. There's been this huge, what's called third wave Platonism that says, no, no, no. All of the drama, all of the dialogue, all of the dialectic, those deeds are all to afford the dialogos and that can't be captured by a monologic argument, monologic argument. Wow, that's... Super. I've never heard of the. Is it Wayson selection task? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Is, yes. Is that somehow related to the wisdom of crowds, where you've seen, you know, it, it, it can be. I mean, uh, there's also the foolishness of crowds, but there is a way in which I mean, I take it, right? and if I'm imposing on you, uh, let me know. But I take it you think that there is a distributed cognition running through markets that has a capacity to solve problems properly dispose labor and effort and innovation right in a way that individuals can't do absolutely i mean it's um it the market it's reflected in people trying to outperform the market and in investment right yes. nobody can do it reliably the thing it's yes. the, the market process is smarter than any of us individually because it's and that's, comprised that's of all an, of us that's an instance of the dialogical nature of rationality and the fact that it evolves in some way to try to fit its environment is again the the fact that it, it is seeking a kind of relationship to the world that transcends any of our individual perspectives of course we can absolutize the market and then that could be problematic too etc but i take it and you're, you're agreeing that it's an instance of the very kind of uh, dialogical reason within distributed cognition that Plato is pointing us to, right? So remember when I was holding up my flashlight and doing all these aspects, I can get some sense of the through line and then I can imagine various things, but you can, you're seeing it from a totally different perspective and you can imagine uses that I can, the chances that the, together we'll be more faithful to the whole and trace out that through line of the good grows as we enter into a dialogical partnership with each other yeah that makes that makes a ton of sense um I, have you heard of metcalf's law this is um it's a network architecture principle but basically you could think that if you had five phones on a phone network i, I may be off on the numbers here but say if you have five phones there's like 12 possible connections oh yes the callers I do but keep going but keep then going. if you go like from five phones to i think it's 10 it jumps to like 70 possible connections yes, and then if you yes, go to yes. you know 20 yes. phones it's like a thousand connections so the number of connections possible connections grows non-linearly to the number yes. of network nodes yes yes and very much. it seems like maybe that's somehow related that you're just getting it's the connection right that's the dialogical that's the channel yes. through which the dialogical phenomenon occurs. And so you're seeing maybe like, uh, like you said, one person has a 10% chance, four people have an 80% chance. How did that happen? Yes. It's got that yes. it has something to do with the connections between those people. Because I assume yes. if you had four people together that couldn't talk to each other, you wouldn't get that result. Exactly. They have to be connected dialogically. Mm -hmm. If one person is trying to impose their perspective on all the others, right, uh, you know, some sort of tyrannical thing, then you won't get the effect. 
So it, it's, it's connection, but it's the right kind of connection as well. So it's both quantity and quality of connection, I would say. Yeah, super interesting to think of it that way. We're right back to the relational, <laughs> the yeah. relational being so primary and important. Um, okay, well, we have not made it extremely far yet, but I'm going to try to jump through a few of these other things. Um, you know, I'm going to skip that one and go to, because I want to get into chapter one here. And the chapter one, the title of it is A Logic of Violence. Yeah. And this is something we talk about a lot in economics and, and in Bitcoin. Um, so I, I want to get to it here. So I'll read an excerpt. Um, Thus, we might say in some that Socrates descent to the Pieris, I may yeah. maybe mispronouncing that, does not end at his host house, but will, but continues all the way down, all the way to the bottom of the cave. Right. What we find there is exposure to sheer power. The setting suggests notably by images and without argumentation that if there is no real love of wisdom and if knowledge is impossible, then the precipitation to uh, Thrasymachus, yes. the Thrasymachus's view yeah. is inevitable. As we will see, Plato seeks to show, particularly in Socrates', Socrates exchange with Thrasymachus, that there's a logical connection between unfoundable opinion, submission to appearance, and the absolutization of power. Yes. So we, we jumped ahead a little bit, but maybe you could describe this tension between Socrates and Thrasymachus, <laughs> the guy with a hard yes. name, Thrasymachus. Um, Thrasymachus. Um, and, you know, I, I guess the punchline here is that there's a deep connection between relativism and it basically descending into this logic of violence. Whereas like when you abandon human reason, you end up in this very kind of doggy dog relational situation um yeah and, and the okay. one sorry Go one ahead. thing I, I would this is a comment that i made on this is a long time ago i read this quote that i love and it seems to apply to all these things is the map is not the territory right or we could say the frame is not reality basically yeah. and when but when we mistake the map for the territory obviously it's intrinsically misleading right you've you're going awry basically because the map is not the territory, but it simultaneously imparts a lot of political <clears throat> political power to the cartographer, whoever's drawing that map. If yeah. everyone's following directions and this one guy is drawing the map, this one political leader or tyrant, whatever it may be, as long as those misled people continue to believe in the veracity of the map, they can con continue to be misled. So this idea of, and I get, this gets into, I guess, appearances versus reality, that if you start to mistake yes. the appearance for the reality, you can just deceive, self-deceive, et cetera. So a, a good thing to do to get Thrasymachus's point is to do what you were already doing intuitively <clears throat> and then extend it a bit. Thrasymachus is, is definitely proposing that, uh, uh, that he can, draw that he's the cartographer but he's also proposing that that ability is not constrained by reality in any way um that right that there isn't something that uh, that he is beholding to beyond himself there's no ecstatic dimension uh within thrasymachus and because of that um there's a sense in which I'll bend metaphors a little bit, but the world is like a blank canvas upon which he draws, and his drawing is just a form of personal expression, right? And that's all it is. And you can hear echoes of romanticism, at least decadent forms of romanticism, uh, Rousseau in, Rousseau's romanticism, and you know, and uh, uh, Schindler talks about Rousseau as one of the first great misologists. Um, so the, the connection is well placed. Right. And so if, if you think about that, right, if you think of, of reality as an empty canvas that will that that you can impose yourself on a will to power, you can express, press yourself on and, and there and there's nothing limiting or constraining that, then then you get a closer model to what Thrasymachus is proposing. And then what Plato is arguing and Schindler's arguing on its behalf 
is if you take out the contemplative, the ecstatic, if you take out the faithfulness to the whole, if you take out that which is beyond me and can challenge, challenge me to self-correct and self-transcend, then you get Thrasymachus's picture. And then the point, the problem with Thrasymachus is why is he trying to convince anybody else? And how could he possibly convince anybody else? And, and why should he care about even his own, right? And so what Socrates does is very quickly sort of show all of the internal self-destructive contradictions within Thrasymachus's point. Um, but, right, and, 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 and like when people, and I think this is often a misreading of Foucault, but when they, you know, it's all just power relations. Well, why do you want power? Like if you don't think power alters reality in some way or, 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 or allows you to the alter the reality of other people in some way, why do you want power? Oh, but it's all power. What, why? Right? And Plato's, and this is what Socrates tries to bring out to Thrasymachus. Well, Thrasymachus wants, wants to be able to do this because he wants to be able to gratify his desires and his needs. But that means there's a world, if you have desires, there's something beyond you that you need, right? And then if you're willing to admit a desire for something beyond you that you need, that you regard as something determining your behavior, then what argument do you have against the good? And that's, that's sort of the move that Socrates makes on him. I see, I see. So once he's admitted to desire he's admitted to something being beyond himself and in an important way yeah and of course he tries to he tries to he tries to pull back from that right and then and, and then he he refuses to talk to socrates and there, there's all kinds of you know um sort of uh manipulative and violent behavior um on Thrasymachus's part and yeah. go ahead Okay, I was just going to read the next excerpt unless you wanted to make a concluding point there. No, I think that I think that I think there's right. There's something right about. And I have the Ohana book on the rise of political nihilism, but there's deep connections between this Thrasymachus's kind of will to power, ultimately nihilistic. Um, approach and and violence because yes. because the only way he 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 in a self-contradictory manner he wants to impose why he prefers his perspective over anybody else is just a third thing that he can't explain at all and then and then you know his desire to impose how can he do this how can he impose it uh, on people when he doesn't think that that that, that reason is, is is available to him or to them well, violence is violence. Uh, and that's what I often, uh, that's why one of my critiques of some readings of some postmodernism, I, I don't want to tar everything with one sloppy brush, but is, you know, it is, well, let's critique re reason. Fair enough. By the way, that's a function of reason in a platonic sense. But towards what end? Like, what is it you, what is it you want to put in its place? or how we seek to satisfy our desires. And Plato's point is once you get rid of reason in the platonic sense, violence is what you have. And remember, deception is a kind of violence. Manipulation is a kind of violence. Right. Not right. all violence right. is physical force, but when you are violated mm -hmm. in your integrity as an agent by manipulation or deception, that is much as much violence as somebody hitting you on the head with a stick. Yeah, and the uh, libertarian philosophy tradition, they often draw that connection between violation and violence, right? Anytime you violate someone's property or person, it's the same thing as violence. So di different in degree, not kind, necessarily. Um, okay, I'll, I'll read this next excerpt to take that point further. He writes, to put it bluntly, the problem with, uh, cannot, sorry, say his name one more time for me. Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus, to put it bluntly, the problem with Thrasymachus is not so much a problem of character as it is more fundamentally a problem with what he takes to be most real. Yes. He will, he will propose, I'm sorry, we will propose in the next chapter that imprisonment in the cave represents the isolation of individual perception 
or what we could call the fragmentariness of relativism right. in contrast to the self-transcending commonality of knowledge. Yes. There is, in other words, an essential connection between violence and sophistic epistemology. Yes. So again, I'm, I'm just going to draw on the American pragmatist definition of truth. Uh, said it's it's found at the end of inquiry. Purse, you're, you're relying on purse. Yep, specific. purse. And yep. the the more common definition of truth is just like an accurate depiction or portrayal of reality. Right. Um, so it, and then is sophistry seems to be an attempt perhaps to substitute this dialogical process of dis inquiry and discovery with a definitive answer or totalized knowledge of some kind. Yeah. So d does sophistry then dissociate individuals from the common binding of knowledge? And in that, if you, if you dissociate the common binding of knowledge, you're breaking consensus, right? People can't really, yes. we can't cooperate or interoperate absent knowledge. Yeah. Then all that's left is we're like reduced to animality, basically. We just, yes. it's pure violence, just dog eat dog world is, um, I just love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I think the point is well said. I think the, the replacement, um, the replacement of the logos, the dialogical process, following the logos, faithfulness to the logos, fidelity to the logos, uh, especially in its communal, common unity, communal, right? Community aspects um, with a totalizing move so the, the 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 sophists at least the sophists as as plato presents them uh, there's historical de argument about this but plato's uh, uh, making a point i think uh about sophistry and bullshit right the sophists were proposing at least an interpretation of rhetoric in which rhetoric was the, 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 the sum total of all the knowledge you needed to have. Because if you had rhetoric, you could manipulate people what they found salient or relevant. And if people's opinion, if man is the measure of all things, one famous sophist, Protagoras, right? If I have rhetoric and I can manipulate opinion and manipulate what's salient and therefore manipulate the measuring of reality that is right how that is all the knowledge i need to have because it will empower me over reality in a way that nothing else possibly could and so i think you're 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 right what uh, right so sophistry in the pejorative sense i'm not sure all the sophists were like this but certainly some of them must be i don't think plato is a liar um and i don't think rhetoric reduces to just bullshit, but it can be put in that service. <clears throat> Nevertheless, those caveats aside, uh, what Schindler is arguing on behalf of Plato is exactly what you said here, right? If, if, we, if, if we move, and, and this is what I meant by this reduction, we go from, right, contemplative rationality to computational rationality, which at least propose to give universal knowledge, shareable knowledge, then we descend into communicative rationality, which all I'm doing is how can I use communication processes, right, to manipulate you, deceive you, mislead you, draw you. And, 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 and that's all the knowledge I need because there is no reality. All there is uh, is the perception of reality. So if I can manipulate the perceptions of reality, that's all I need. And I get a claim to a totalizing kind of knowledge, in, right? And then Plato says, in contrast to that, he offers philia sophia, the shared fellowship love of wisdom. And he says that is what he offers as in, in the place of this idea that all that matters is the perception of reality. And all that matters, therefore, is the manipulation of the perceptions of reality. And therefore, all I need is this one kind of totalizing knowledge, the rhetoric, the ability to manipulate people's salience landscapes. And, and independent 
of their concern for what is true, what is real, et cetera. All right, so the, the absence or removal of reason or knowledge reduces us to just, I guess, the raw power relationships that... But, but um, see, even, even the animal is depending on knowledge, right? And so mm -hmm. this is Plato's point, right? That, right, it, 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 this self-destructiveness is complete, is prevented, self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior is preventing from complete self-annihilation because it doesn't acknowledge the commitment to the good that it is still relying on buried underneath all of this self-deception and self-destructive behavior. It's a great point. So I, I guess that's where we're capable of great evil, right? We can become even, we can get into a much worse situation than animals. Like it could be, yes, you know, genocide is not dog eat dog world. That's a systematic misapplication of the intellect to systematically annihilate people. Yes, yes, and 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 and, and I, I think I think you know the the Platonic, the Christian Platonic notion of evil as self destructiveness, and therefore how it's ultimately dependent on being uh, on the good, uh, so that uh, even the most evil. Dionysus talks about this, the demons, but like even the most evil person, Hitler, and please, everybody listen to me right now. I'm not denying the evil of Hitler. Okay, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But what, you know, and Whitehead said this, the one thing that saves us is that evil is self-destructive, and the Nazis, of course, were, and the communists were too, right? Um, but the, the, the point I want to make is even the, the most evil person is motivated, right, Hitler committed the genocide because he had some very twisted version of what he thought reality was, right. and what he thought the good was. And he, he, he was loyal to Germany and he was loyal to blah, blah. Like he's not, if he was absolutely depraved and deprived of any virtuous ability, he would disappear from existence. Uh, is, is right. Sort of, right? He would lack intelligibility, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. He would right. he would he would disappear into the pure into pure chaos. Yes, that's interesting. That's an interesting connection too. That um, perhaps it's like related to entropy somehow. That if you can, yes. good yes. is that which is anti entropic. Perhaps that's one definition I've used of used for God previously. I know <laughs> definitions never work in that realm of the divine, <laughs> but um, there's that old the, uh, old old quote that. A, uh, a dead thing can go with the stream only a living thing can swim against it I think it's yes maybe uh chesterton or someone else but um and i know in that book the other book that you recommended that i read which I also read was theophany they talk about uh evil being the absence of the good almost like the shadows of the light something like that yes exactly exactly yeah. exactly and um one way in which the christian platonists talk about god is in the depths of the depravity of evil, there is still this dependency on the good in the way we've been talking about it. And that is one way in which the Christian Platonists tried to argue for God, because even the, the deepest evil uh, doesn't remove that dependence on the good. Now, I don't think that deals with the problem of evil, which is a problem for people who have a theistic view. But I do think there's something to this idea of the primacy the primordiality of the of the ontological good that should be treated in a reverential fashion. I think there's something ultimately sacred about it. Pearl makes this argument um, in Theophany. He makes it also in Thinking Being, and Schindler is making a very similar claim. If you love it and you love it as a, a whole uh, towards which you can always self-transcend, that sounds to me like reverence and uh, a sense of the sacred. And so I get, I get something of what the Christian Platonists were trying to point to. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. There's a number of things coming up for me. One is again, in that book, well, I guess I would say this first, that in the Austrian economic school, they say all action is an expression of value. So everyone has an internalized set of priorities or values. Whatever you're doing in that moment is an expression of your highest value or yeah. priority so maybe another way to say that is whatever you're doing you think it's good right it could be pure evil even if it's hitler but 
in whatever twisted version of his reality, he thought that was the good thing to do. Yes. Um, and, and let's remember, and again, please hear me. I'm not justifying Hitler, mm-hmm. but there were things he was responding to that were real issues in Germany and the Weimar Republic. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with his response. I don't agree with his solutions, let alone with his final solutions right. um, that are disgusting. But there, there, he came to power for, and I use this word correctly, for a reason, right? And we have to understand that. Uh, and that's again, there. That's again the presence of the good, even within, uh, you know, very significant depravity of evil. I would add that he came to power in the ashes of the Weimar hyperinflation. Yes. So there yes. again, if the printing yeah. of money is related to the collapse of your, you know, yes. sphere of spatio-temporal yes. concern, Excellent. everyone's Excellent. went to zero, and then we get yes. this guy. Um, yeah. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because it came up to me as you were saying that was, again, in that book, Theophany, which I'll probably have to talk to you about that at some point, too. It's so good. But he draws this connection. <laughs> he draws this connection, I think, between, I might be getting over my skis here, but sort of uh, identifying God as the the force that gives structural integrity to hierarchies or, or perhaps yeah, reality it- itself. Yeah, it's 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 the it's the one that is behind. Beh- so to be to be something is to be one, uh, which is different from just an aggregate of things, and 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 and, and so and to know something is to know what ones it, what integrates it, what organizes it together. And of course, if I have two things, I know. If I know how, what binds them together, I get a deeper knowledge. And the idea right. is what this leads you to is, well, there's an ultimate sort of oneing that is identical, by the way, to the oneing of the through line of the good. This is the main claim of Neoplatonism. And of course, Pearl is talking about uh, Christian Neoplatonism is in the book on Theophany. So exactly that, that, that is, a, that is uh, an understanding of God. I think it's ultimately a non-theistic understanding of God, but I think it's an understanding of God um, that, um, first of all, has, a, has I think, a, a really good um, legacy and provenance. And I, I, it, I think it recommends itself as a consideration of God, if what we mean by God is the sort of sacred, sacred depths of reality. Um, that we should consider again. Um, and so, and Pearl is doing an excellent work. And, and I'm glad you're reading those two books together because they really sing to each other, right? The, oh, yeah. uh, the Platonic and the Neoplatonic really sing together uh, really, really beautifully. They do. And their the writing styles contrast so nicely. You know, I yes. think um, Schindler elaborates much more, whereas... Yes. Pearl is like crystallized yes. philosophy. Yes. Or something. It's yes. really beautiful. Yes. Um, yes. So yeah, I was just connecting those things because again, if if there's that force that holds the hierarchy, that integrates the hierarchy, that's again back to this kind of relational thing, and it seems like maybe that you know to put God at the top of the hierarchy, so to speak, is the process of binding hierarchies at the top of the hierarchy. So it's again not. No particular frame is at the top of the hierarchy. It's the process of framing or transframing. Um, yeah, I, the, the, again, the, the, the process of living out and participating in the promise of intelligibility and right. that intelligibility will, as we, as we deepen our intelligibility, we will find ourselves in contact with the depths of reality. Right, right. And then the, and then the idea about God is this, right? Oh, wow, well, talking about God. <laughs> but well, at least within uh, within Pearl's explanation of what Dionysus is, is, is the Dionysus the Areopagite um, is the source of intelligibility. The good is not itself intelligible, right? Just like the through line is not any particular aspect or perspective or relation. Right. But the no thingness, the no thingness that binds them uh, together, and so uh, as as the ground source, whatever, I don't know what the words are failing me here, of intelligibility and being, right? 
the good, the one, is not itself intelligible. This is what Plato means in the Republic when he says the good is beyond being, because it is the source of intelligibility, being, logos and being, logos and ontos, and the wedding of logos and onto, uh, ontos, it is not it is not expressible or right or, or identifiable with, with with logos or ontos or the wedding of logos and ontos because it is that from which and to which they are always um, um, in debt. I guess is the word the way I want. Right. To, right. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's and it's a whole other can of worms, but um, we, we should mention here probably that this is a non theistic definition of God, like the yes. it's a very well reasoned philosophical sequence that gets to their definition of God. It's not like they just, hey, there's a guy in the sky out here. It's um, no, 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 that, no, 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 which really resonated with me, by the way, to just see that yeah. it was a it was a union for in a way of philosophy yeah. and religion. Yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, it's it, it, it very powerfully so. And um, Right, the the notion of the the good or the one, um, uh, and Neoplatonism is that they're 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 the same in some sense. Um, I, I I think it's very clearly uh, non-theistic in Plato and in um, uh, in in the pagan Neoplatonists. Um, so uh, whether or not it becomes theistic, I still think it's non-theistic in. Um, and people like Dionysus and Maximus, but other people claim that's what classical theism is, and it's very different from what's now modern common theism. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I'm trying to sort that out, but we don't need to get a mesh uh -huh. that. Yeah. But what? But remember what I said about you can actually practice dialectic into the logos. And what happens when people sense the logos and that they're following the logos, and it's something beyond any one of them individually? They start independent, independent of their backgrounds. They start to talk about it in religious terms. Right, right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, I want to just try to articulate one more thing that came up for me, and then I'll I'll read some excerpts here, and we can we can wrap up. But um, the idea of the good being transcendent. Yes. Uh, I don't you know if you've ever heard of this book, Flatland. It's kind of an yes, interesting I've book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's. Yeah. You know creatures in a two-dimensional world and then they start interacting with three-dimensional creatures and it creates all these you know weird perceptions yeah. for them but i kind of had that thought that if you if our reality was on one flat plane you know one sheet of paper if you will and the good was a sphere you know going through that sheet of paper yeah it would always you know in flatland you would just see the circle right as the sphere moved through the paper changing yeah, yeah, yeah expanding and then closing and then disappearing ultimately the circle would always be um understood at that plane but you could from that plane of reality the two-dimensional plane of all reality you could never perceive the third dimension yes so it seems like that's kind of what we're doing with the good here is like there's a third quote unquote third dimension to it which i guess would actually be yes. a, a fourth or tenth or whatever it may be yeah. that we can't perceive but we can look at this thing from multiple angles just like if we yes. looked at that circle from multiple angles we could deduce perhaps yeah. i don't know if deduce is the right word either Abduce. Abduce. Purse. Purse. yeah purse, yes. um, yeah. and I, I think the other so that was just the visual that came to me for that but then the other i think the uh analogy that pearl uses is light right where he says like in the same yeah. way that you, you can't see light you only see by means of it you see by means of it yes you see through light you don't see light yes. just yes. like you see through by means the of the good we don't see the good yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly exactly and plato compares the good to light and he compares it actually to the source of if light is intelligibility then the good is the source of intelligibility like the sun is the source of light um and you can't actually look directly at the sun uh, because it will <laughs> Well, your perceptual abilities. You can look at reflections and glimpses, and you can multiple perspectives, and you can try and get a sense of uh, of, of of what it is. And that's what Plato says: why we need to practice dialogical, contemplative rationality in order to get that. But you can see you can see something analogous to the expansion and the contraction 
of the circle um, in Flatland in, in uh, Theophany, because you can see how the, the, the Neoplatonic idea that everything, we have to use temporal language, but it's not happening in time. Everything proceeds from the one. All of the, all of the minis come out of the one, all the, right? But all of the mini things are also constantly integrating back, especially as they make sense to the one. And so you get the procession and the return is very much like the expansion and the contraction of the circle because it's ultimately a neoplatonic metaphor. That's great. Yeah. The, the, the identity between the procession and the reversion was very interesting too, because it's, yeah. you know, everything that's happening is also creating some counter force. And yeah, it's really interesting. Okay. I know we're close to time here. I want to just read three more little excerpts here and then get your thoughts on it. Um, are you good for another five or seven minutes? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. So Schindler, back in the book now, writes, to persuade accordingly comes to mean to lend prevailing force to a particular appearance or as a historical pro protagoras, protagoras, protagoras. And yeah, protagoras. protagoras himself is supposed to have put it to make the weaker argument stronger. Yes. Thus, knowledge comes to mean power in an even more direct way than we are accustomed to understanding it. Not that knowing something gives one the ability to make changes, but that knowledge itself is nothing more than an ability to change. Yes. I thought that was really just a powerful phrase. And then I'll, I'll read a couple more here. Socrates professes no knowledge, and yet he remains throughout the dialogue a sort of anchor around which the discussion is ordered. Yes. Uh, Thras <laughs> Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus. One of these days I'll get that name. Thrasymachus professes knowledge and yet never seems to stick to a basic stance. How are we to make sense of this paradox? Yes. He goes on to write, positions thus have a kind of immediacy for Thrasymachus. They are, as it were, self-contained intellectual units, which are either presented or kept back. He thinks of ideas as possessions things that yes. can be extended to others only in terms of buying and selling. Yes. And um, again, I thought this, I may mention this earlier, but Carl Jung quote, which is amazing. People don't have ideas. Ideas have people. Yes. yes. So is the essential divide. And one other thing I would say here is that um, Thrasymachus thinking that ideas can be bought and sold or possessed and owned. This is ludicrous, frankly. Um, again, libertarian philosophers will tell you, you can't own an idea. It's not possible, right? Like we, we have it in yeah. copyright law. We have intellectual property and all of this, but the actual owning of an idea is not possible because it's, it's a non-scarce good. It's just a pattern, right? If I yes. send you an idea, it's not like the idea left my head and went into yours. I just shared yes. with you. We both have the idea. So yeah, is the yeah. essential divide between, or an essential divide between uh, Socrates and Thrasymachus, is it this Jungian no notion of ideas, um, well, which, which is also reflected, sorry to add one more <laughs> wrinkle to the question, that divide in their perceptions related to the meaning of the word power, which this was in a footnote too, that Socrates interpreted as a capacity to serve, right. whereas uh, Thrasymachus, whatever his name is, <laughs> <laughs> perceived it as a capacity to acquire and i've often yes. thought about that relationship too because again power is important we we generate power and whatever in the economy but political power is dangerous and so the, the making of economic power is good but the taking of political power can be dangerous so sorry that was a mouthful would love to hear your no, no no I, i've been doing lots of mouthfuls on you um I, so i believe we talked about this last time we talked about from and the being mode and the having mode and what, what's going on here. So Asimachus has a having mode relationship to ideas. Um, and he thinks of them as uh, things that he possesses and controls that he has and that he can manipulate. Um, whereas Socrates thinks of ideas, idos, the word idea actually comes from idos, which is the where do we translate as Plato's theory of the forms, forms, idos. It actually means sort of the aspect or look of something. Um, but Socrates' relationship to this is one of participation. He's in the being mode. He thinks of ideas as ways in which he 
ways in which he can help people to give birth to themselves. We, and this is why we still have the notion of conceiving of an idea, conception, oh, giving birth, yeah. right? Right. Huh. And so, and, play, and Socrates described himself as a midwife, and his job was to help people to give birth to themselves. So he sees ideas from the being mode. He sees them of uh, ways of entering into right relationships that afford development as opposed to possessions that afford control. And so Thrasymachus, to use Fromm's term, is engaging in modal confusion. There's nothing wrong with the having mode, right? And it's not that the being mode is good and the having mode is wrong. It's when you confuse the two in which you pursue being needs through the having mode. We talked about like this, like for, right? I need to be in love. And this is, you know, a right relationship that develops me and hopefully the other person. And I can confuse that with having sex. I need to be mature and I can confuse that with having a car. I need to be wise and I confuse that with having particular ideologies because ideology, I would argue, is the having mode of ideas. Wow, that's that's a fascinating way to put it. Um, uh, perhaps connected to Eros and Philea, right? Eros is you want the final, you want to consume the thing versus Philea is... Right. Or but be Philea, by it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Philea, in one way, in what, what you can see Plato doing with Eros, especially very much with Eros, especially in the symposium, but through other, other dialogues too, um, is he's trying to transform the Greek notion of Eros and integrate it with Philea and point it towards something that's not going to come to fruition on for, in his work, I think, but he's pointing it ultimately towards what's going to become Agape. Wow. John, thank you so much. Um, this has been a great conversation and I look forward to our next one. Me too, Robert. This, this, one, this, was, this was really wonderful. I really appreciate this. And uh, thank you for, uh, for helping us trace the through line through this book. Uh, you did it very well. <laughs> thank you.